Politicons, written by Oliver Arnold, performed by Adam Eleven Labs. One. Those too smart to engage in politics are punished by being governed by those who are dumber. Plato. Donner Gould was everything he hated. Cold, wet, dirty, and what was this hollow feeling in his belly? Gould didn't recognize the sensation, but knew that he didn't enjoy it. Only minutes earlier, he'd woken on the street, behind a row of abandoned cars at surface level. It was dark. The sky poked through only minuscule gaps between the buildings hundreds of stories above. Smoke, steam, and dust blew across. Muffled shrieks of creatures unseen tore through the air. Gould contemplated the incessant rain of garbage, his eyes following bits of refuse as they landed on the sea of trash he was now in. As he gazed up, spit hit his face, and Gould now recognized the building towering beside him. He'd landed on its roof only days earlier, but this was not an environment for contemplation, contemplated Gould. It would quickly expose any weakness and destroy the weakling. Gould was not entirely unaccustomed to danger, of course, having thrived in a system of backstabbing. Weaknesses in politics were not necessarily paid for with blood, yet always dearly. Gould imagined a world without him. Tremors of change would follow his departure, such was his eminent importance. Naturally, he'd bred his children to fill his spot, but were they ready? Oh, to be trifling, he mused. A creature perishing down here made no difference, not even to this shitty place. Yet these brutes could lead their lives in any way they saw fit, within their crappy means. A guttural sports chant pushed Gould out of his ruminations. Proles. Friends once staged a fight between such a prole and a gorilla for the crowd's amusement. The prole had ripped the animal apart. The poly decided to make off. Ducking, moving from cover to cover, Gould advanced cautiously, his muscle suit creaking as the politicon squatted, bent, and crouched, poses he had not assumed since childhood. He now questioned the wisdom of breeding proles, the dangerous half-humans cultivated over decades to supply votes, a biomass that lived away from all other citizens in the lowest, gloomiest canyons of the city. High up above him, he could make out vehicles zooming past, and he wondered what it would take to hail one. An absurd impossibility. Although some of his associates came down here for sport, he'd never enjoyed wading through refuse. Gould took no pleasure in physical activity, and was proud that he'd never killed anyone, directly. How about backstabbing? If the victim doesn't see you, does it count as your murder? Gould lifted the friendship rock the resistors had left for him and waded through swamps of knee-deep rubbish that had accumulated over decades of the fall, seeking the chopter waiting for him and him alone. He'd show them all and claim his prize, which would promptly get him to the island experience of endless leisure. But first, there was work. He needed to find the way, a path to the vehicle that would transport him to paradise. This uprising could have been worse, his exile, his banishment to a tropical island. He imagined bare all beauties feeding him pineapples. Out of nowhere, a car crashed down right in front of the poly. The waste wave blew the politicon off his feet and deep into the trash. Indeed, this was not a place to let your mind wander. This environment, like Gould, the ruler who destroyed without thought would crush in an instant. Ruler? Had he truly been one? Gould wasn't sure. He hadn't paid attention to national events for years. Only the people around him, influencers, the show, the GM, had been important. He noticed one of the omnipresent cameras that had been favored during the early years of the regime. It looked old and dilapidated. It was hard to tell if it was still running. He waved at the device but received no response. Then he saw the note. It appeared new and out of place, like a beacon in the midst of the filth. It was stuck right near the lens on a street sign. It must have taken considerable effort to place that high up, out of reach of the proles. He began to climb the signpost at the speed of Koala. Go street opposite, left, second right. A friend, the note said. Gould felt watched. Was this information for him? His name wasn't mentioned, and the memo could be centuries old. Yet, it sure didn't look that way. Lacking options, the senator turned and followed the directions. After nearly an hour of arduous trudging, Gould turned the initial corner described in the note and froze. He found himself right in front of a domed structure made entirely out of garbage. 
About the size of a car, it looked like something an animal would build, a prolopod. Gould knew it was likely occupied by multiple females, mating, nursing, and watching the tube. The males, or husbands, were either arguing with them or worse, prowling the area. Gould realized how little he knew about the creatures and how little he cared. The entrance pointed away from him, lucky, he thought, when suddenly a pale, stringy being emerged from the den. Fortunately, Gould's knees gave in, and he dropped into the trash. Obscene groans, panting and shouting came from the inside, but the male prole gave it no heed. He sniffed the air, then made away until he vanished. The poly didn't dare move. He listened intently, but no sounds of running TV sets were audible from inside. Gould decided to play it safe and wait. He began to dig through the trashed remnants of the early totalitarian days. There were heaps of leaflets from the dystopia of old. He found pictures of his glorious grandfather and smiled affectionately. The old devil was shown taking his enemies for a walk. He'd been known to enslave his adversaries instead of killing them, and he was showing them off as his pets. Gould smirked at the power and symbolism behind this unapologetic display and pocketed the photo. Now there were no more enemies, no more dissenters. The system was nearly complete and perfected. How this ultimate empire could have stood eternally. He lovingly thought back to the introduction of implanted mind control, the culling of genitals, and the total segregation of classes in a society by a physical barrier. It was all for their best. Down here, proles and the like lived as they pleased, and their existences weren't entirely worthless. Up in the sky, they had representatives, one for every lock of them, casting votes in their stead. Gould's mind veered off to his past and the young, foolish fantasies of overcoming the GM. Naturally, he'd never gone through with them. Suicide, that would be. He pondered whether his great-grandfather would have had the guts to locate and overcome the unknown ruler of the world. The shouts of two approaching proles rudely snapped Gould back to reality. They were intoxicated, blasting sports chants, and heading straight for the den to mate. Short of entering, one fell silent and sniffed the air. Alerted by a suspicious scent, the creature moved toward Gould's hiding spot. The poly didn't dare breathe. Yet when the den's TV came on and the two accords of Happy Happy Baby Baby alternated, the prole made inside to be glued to the screen for hours. The program was interrupted three times a day for viewers to feed, breed, and defecate. There had been experiments with extended viewing times, but losses had been high. Mankind wasn't ready for that yet. Enough thinking already. Gould rushed off. After wandering for the better part of an hour, the poly still followed the note's instructions. Yet the closer he came to his destination, the more he doubted his choice. The scattered debris and rubbish grew ever larger and deeper. It would soon become impassable. When an unholy screech resonated from a building nearby, Gould was ready to turn back. Just then, his glance caught a small white piece of paper pinned to a lamppost ahead. Another note. Head to the lion, it said. Gould had no clue what that meant. After scanning the area, he noticed a badly smashed sign that showed a red creature that Gould thought to be a lion. At the sign, there were no further details and no additional notes. He was tired of this game. He wanted it to end. Then Gould heard the chants. Pairs of rhythmic grunts. Proles. Again. A trap. I. Fooled. When the prole pack approached, the manimals spotted Gould immediately, yet as if not trusting their senses, they froze. Fear gripped Gould's heart like never before. After codified exchanges of strikes and punches, the proles had assured themselves of the prize ahead, and they came for the politician with great speed. Gould didn't think. He rushed off in the opposite direction as fast as his trunk junk and the street junk allowed. The proles held the advantage. They were lean and light, with their small heads and pyramidal shoulders, grown to swiftly drift through rubbish. And of course, they were used to hunting this way. Gould's only hope was to find shelter quickly. It was when the poly turned a corner that he saw the giant metallic wall ahead of him, cutting through streets and buildings, an impenetrable blockade of an indestructible alloy. Gould knew what he was looking at. A district divider, a seal to keep the proles from vital infrastructure. The edifice sported a massive gate at its center, but it was closed, sealed in, and surely hadn't yawned in decades. This was it. There was no way out or over. 
He was finished. He'd fallen for someone's fool. He'd been played. He, of all people, was had. Caught in a dead end, a violent death approaching. Out of desperation, Gould rushed onward, all the way to the gate, and pushed. It didn't yield. He thought of his wives and children touching his stuff after his demise. It made him sick. Then a smile crossed his face. Spittle. Would his trusty assistant have the pyramid ready? Gould was jealous of the spectators who would marvel at his magnificent burial for the ages. But it wasn't that time yet. The old urge to fight rose back up in the politician. Should he try a magical blast to vaporize his enemies? If he concentrated hard enough, it would work. He didn't try. Cowering by the gate, covering his eyes like a scared child, the Polly awaited his fate the way he'd lived, eyes wide shut. Suddenly, a deafening creak overpowered the howling horde. A towering giant of infinite destructive power is coming to my aid, Gould thought with his eyes still closed. He felt the giant's footsteps reverberate in the metal he leaned upon and dared a peek. Un be leavable. The gate was opening. He rose, his eyes glued to the split that was widening by the millimeter. The proles were nearly upon him. They knew exactly where he was. The dang thing didn't move fast enough, and of course there was no giant. Was this part of an observer's cruel game? Gould watched the widening split with one eye and the ever-nearing horde with the other. His heart raced. It was set to detonate. Every beat was a tick. He began to squeeze himself into the opening, chafing his fine jacket and piercing his suit. Obnoxious noises emerged from the fake air-filled muscles as Gould squeezed himself through with all his possible might. More proles appeared between the vehicles behind him now, not thirty yards away. Gould pressed himself harder, releasing an incredible amount of hot air to finally make it through. Just then, the massive gate reverted, and as the beasts reached the barrier, it slammed shut. Gould hunkered down, catching his breath. He could not believe his luck. No, it couldn't have been that. There had been a benign force, a friend who had been watching his every move. The note's author? Gould looked around. This side of the wall was clean and well-maintained. At street level, the infrastructure was vital to the city's functioning and frequently attended to. Only now, Gould noticed the chopter standing right there, neatly parked on the polished concrete. He straightened his wig and made the easy walk over to the flying machine. Two. Gould sat hunched, red-faced, and sweating intensely. His lowered designer pants stretched far across his copious calves as soothing images from teletiles along the walls presented stimulating visions of trucks dumping heavy loads, dams releasing huge floods, and cranes dropping weighty burdens. A noise cancellation system stood ready to catch any offending sound, instantly turning it into a cello's open sea. This sitting had been taking forever. His head felt heavy. He would rest it for just one minute. One minute only. Without warning, Donner Gould found himself in a desert land right before dawn. Ahead lay a village asleep. The town sat surrounded by miles of sand, broken only by the outlines of spattered rock. All seemed quiet at first, but then Gould noticed movement. The boulders stirred, and the politician realized that the rocks had not been stones at all, but an army advancing under the cover of night, ready to fall upon the unsuspecting village. It was a settlement entirely of women, Gould knew. Just then, the sun broke over the horizon, and its rays swept the land. But this was no ordinary light. Where the star touched the soil, it began to stir. The perplexed warriors halted and watched in disbelief as liquefied metals urged from the ground, sprouting like flowers in the spring. At first they trickled, but then combined into ever stronger flows of the land's blood, all surges had a common destination, a stony plateau. When they hit the rock, they bubbled and merged into an animated soup. Gould watched as the mass formed an arm, then a chest. The planet's veins had spilled their goodness to birth. A golden colossus. The humanoid rose to a crouch and dropped any lesser matter from its lower back, purifying itself to the highest standards. It would come to the defense of the virgins and their babies, and it looked like... An alarm blared. When Gould jerked up, a green glow around the toilet seat marked the odor cancellation system activating. Had it all been a dream? 
The poly cursed and inspected the result below. It sparkled mysteriously. Gould grinned knowingly and hit the flush, causing the entire toilet to vanish below while a replacement materialized from the wall. Deliver to your home? asked the machine. Yes, he retorted, as the alarm blared again, twice. Gould dragged his mighty figure of folds from the bathroom into the adjacent TV studio wardrobe. Here, teletiles across the walls flashed programs from around the globe. Gould made his way past his fine, megahogany furniture and toward a large lighted mirror, where his assistant, Spittle, waited to hand him a communicator. A lady was on the line. Good evening, Mr. Gould. This is Debbie from Lifetime Encounters. Gould had been expecting her call. Yes, I'm in, uh, need of company. Very well, Mr. Gould. Why don't you characterize yourself? Um, let's see. I'm not hospitable. I don't love to eat, drink, or laugh. There's nothing I would die for. I possess no fairness or piety. I'm not sentimental. No affection for dogs or babies. No love for mothers, the common man, or veterans. I'm not bestowed with a sense of military valor. I don't care about my ex-wives. There's no great love for sex or women in me. I have no family values, no Protestant work ethics, no Catholic moral seriousness, and no sense of gratitude. There's no intellectual precision or sense of history within me. I care about neither the life of the mind nor the life of the senses. I don't believe in honor among thieves. I have no code against cheating or lying. I don't do philanthropy and have no interest in the arts. He drew a deep breath. Oh, you're a poly. Debbie paused. I'll see what I can do, she then said, and quickly disconnected. Debbie, what are you wearing? Granted no answer, Gould shrugged, tossed the communicator, and then gyrated onto a chair with multiple pipes protruding from its seat. The tubing led to an apparatus near the wall, labeled Physicare 200 Atu. He lowered his rump onto the chair, wiggling in an effort to align the center pipe. A laser buzzed to life, zeroing in on Gould's tracking marker while the legislator spread his cheeks to aid the machine. Once down, the poly fumbled a control on the armrest, activating a compressor. Gradually, channels of inflatable musculature all around Gould's body filled. His wrinkles vanished, his pose righted itself. He passed the time, musing. You know, Spittle, if I, the GM forbid, pass one day, I want to be buried in the middle of Hatton. Certainly, sir. The underling coughed at the impossible supposition. You know, in a big, beautiful pyramid right downtown for all to see. Sir, there isn't any room in the part of the city that was renamed Hatton after Manhattan was deemed opinionated. Gould ignored his lackey's concerns. You know, like those other god kings of old, and what's that country with the sand? Perhaps, sir, if you were a king, or god. Spittle's words didn't register. Put my superabundant possessions right in there with me, along with my nail clippings. Spittle hesitated. Sir, how would we retrieve your discarded nail clippings? He answered himself. Oh dear, you're keeping them. Ping. The chair's motor whined, and just before Gould turned bubbly, it stopped and reverted, sucking the skin back onto him to finish with a muscular, seemingly lean physique. Gould placed his small hand on Spittle's shoulder. And you'll be in there with me, my trusty advisor. Gould, who knew no humor, heaved with laughter. Spittle gulped. Now upright and buff, Gould tended to his weedy hair, reaching for a monumental fiber-optic wig. He positioned the device, referencing the mirror, and initialized it. The hair responded with changing colors as Gould grimaced at himself, matching his expressions in undulating patterns, much like the entrance to a nightclub. Gould hated the wig. The blinking nonsense was for girls, an unmanly and clownish accessory. Nothing commands more respect than a full head of natural hair. If you combined all strands on a man's head, you'd get the size of his manhood, Gould was certain. But slicked back, it had to be. Immediately, all observers would know your love of sports and lack of humor. Like the flag on a masthead, this was the beacon first visible to approaching mates and business partners alike. Done with the wig, Gould reviewed his scrotal circumference. Not good, not good. He activated a hidden mechanism inside his pants, thus starting a pump to increase his interlegular volume. After reaching double tennis ball, he stopped approvingly. Next, there was the stream suit, a blazer made of conductive LED fabric. Just as Gould slipped into it, though, 
A program on the teletiles caught his attention, where a foreign strongman presented his collection of golden toilets. Gould keenly followed the unnecessary display of wealth, then shook his head. Inspiring, he mumbled, and activated his suit. Inspiring scrolled around his torso, down his arms, and over his chest, where it stopped, flashed, and vanished. Gould looked himself over one last time, adjusted the suit's elbow armor that had served him well so many times, and smelled his hands. They passed. The alarm sounded yet again, three times in a row. The poly thrust his fist forward as if stabbing the air. His mood lifted. Just when he was ready to leave, a man in military fatigues rushed into the room. Sir, we must exert preemptive measures on Miseraban. You are urgently required to supervise the airstrikes tonight. I'm afraid you'll miss your televised appearance. When Gould hesitated, the uniformed man continued, Mr. Manny approved it. Gould stopped cold, looking irritated. What does the GM say? GM says to nuke them. Then nuke them! Gould had rudely shoved past the general when Spittle called him back. Sir, your charge. Right, Gould said, and turned back to Spittle, who offered him a bowl filled with colorful tinsel. He grabbed a handful, stuffed it in his crotch, and left. Three. A shaggy figure dragged itself through the city's canyons of gray and brown. Down here on the mid-levels, no natural light and no plant life could be found. The narrow roads were surrounded by massive buildings shooting thousands of feet into the sky. Like jungle giants, their bases sprouted innumerable tangles of pipes and cables, crisscrossing and then disappearing underground. Infinitely far overhead in the sky zoomed shiny flying cruisers, the conveyances of the rich. They gleamed in the sun and had become the falling stars of the lower dwellers' unending dusk. Not many people were out, and in the eerie quiet, only the rustle of thousands of dreamily descending floating bits was audible. But this was not the golden season, and the sad rain was garbage carelessly tossed from the higher levels to join an incessant, corrupted fall. The man named Anfred crossed the road without worry. Cars had long ceased in perpetual congestion and were converted into dwellings. He stopped at a bridge and opened a turnip bar, then tossed the wrapper over the side, where it joined the endless flurry of rubbish on its way to the surface level. A thick ocean of refuse had formed down there over the decades. Anfred's eyes followed the wrapper down, and he gulped. It wasn't the heights that scared him, but the terrors that lurked below. He heard a screech, much like a kid's. Had it been one? Unlikely, the surface was the dominion of the proles. Anfred thought of the children he'd never have. Good, his descendants would only degrade into the dirt below, an unbearable thought. Continuing onward, Anfred passed an aged graffito. He smiled at the ancient insolence that was unheard of during his lifetime. A stunt like that would get you into jail for life these days, and not the voting part. Somewhere from a window sounded music. The happy tunes stood in odd contrast to the gray reality of this world, but he knew that they were automatically produced by artificial minds and then consumed by another digital intelligence to be rated, posted, and commented upon. Depending on the latency of this process alone, the songs would make it up the charts, or not. It didn't matter. Most people had ceased listening long ago. Suddenly, Anfred was jerked around. Give me your bit bucks, yelled a masked man holding only a rusted pipe. Anfred shrugged. Er, rub your D-Day vice, he stuttered. He was losing his speech, but not from fear. His mind was on its way out. Anfred raised his crummy communicator. Slower, slower, the ruffian shouted. The two men rubbed their gadgets together to transfer the loot. Finally, a beep announced the completed transaction. What? The robber stared at his screen in disbelief. Three books, that's it. We rub phones for dat? Anfred was not surprised. Hack, kickers, up from the b bank drain in my account. He choked. This was a long sentence. See, lyrical error, but they c c kept the money to cover ex pences. The robber lost interest and took off. Anfred turned at the fountain of milk and honey, the landmark of goodness and giving, a token of the government's generosity. The beautifully detailed arrangement cycled actual nutriment through animatronic statues, designed to feed the needy. Yet no poor were near, as access was barred by razor wire and rats bathed in the sticky soup. Anfred's eyes passed over one sculpture's well-stocked cornucopia 
and he wondered what those oddly shaped vegetables were. There was an elongated yellow one, another round and red, so saturated it made Anfred dizzy. Types of turnips they were, he decided, and walked on. Buzz drones began to whir around Anfred's head, strobing visual programming at rates that shot the uninitiated into a seizure. The generated jumble was engineered to overload the senses and cope with nothing else for hours. No thought or reflection was possible after one received such blasts. Anfred mechanically shushed the pesky machines, but to no avail. Designed for this very purpose, they evaded his hands with effortless immediacy. Anfred continued to brave the annoyances of the street, for today was election day and he was angry. He craved change and would make his voice heard. He made his way past crowds of hunched pedestrians packing freedom rocks shaped like feathers, hearts, or smileys. Humility was freedom, was happiness. No one complained about these government-issued burdens. Finally, at the voting prison, he went directly for the ballot bandits, contraptions resembling casino slot machines. As the discs spun, Anfred reflected on the old systems, in which a candidate of your choice was frequently out or overvoted, forcing you to choose a different one. This was no longer the case, as hardly anyone bothered with the candidate side of the elections. After pulling the lever, you'd get symbols to exchange for votes or goodies. Most people picked the goodies. The discs came to a rest. Anfred received three sons, and a smile crossed his face. He could get the candidate he wanted, or tokens for five episodes of Happy Happy Baby Baby. After a hesitation that didn't feel entirely his own, he chose the tokens and rushed out. Why had he come here? It didn't matter. He had his coupons, and he knew the episodes would calm him, provide laughter, and provide distraction. Outside, he ran into a commotion. This was alarming, as raised voices always meant serious trouble. Anfred looked the other way, but couldn't help witnessing the crazed, screaming person approaching. Rise! The GM is on the rise! We must rise! After mere seconds, peace enforcement brought him down. You kill me now? The haggard man stuttered with his face in the dirt. The officers grinned. No, you'll get rewarded. One whistled, and a chopter with a colossal freedom rock arrived to hover over the man. You get our XXL edition? The aircraft dropped the heart-shaped boulder onto the screamer. They make great tombstones as well. The officer snickered and left. Anfred rushed into a media store. The shop was colorfully decorated, with stand-ups of all the popular shows. Hentracontamom, Judge Eros, Happy Happy Baby Baby, and of course, Politicons. There were no other customers in the small outlet. The man behind the counter was tattered and stringy, yet an intimidating brutality radiated from him. He looked Anfred over distrustfully. You buy, you buy, he asked. I buy. Anfred handed him the tokens. When the owner saw Anfred's symbols, he skipped. You buy, happy, happy, baby, baby. Anfred hesitated. His head spun. This sometimes happened. He would desire one thing while the back of his mind suggested another. He bought the baby videos regardless. But then, just as he was leaving the store, the clerk called him back. You want more stronger? Anfred stopped, but didn't look back. Yes, he surprised himself by saying, and with that, he returned to the counter. The owner held up a resonator, scanned Anfred, and then led him through a back door into an alley, where he was left with another darker man. The ominous figure stared silently. Anfred struggled to keep his calm. He was about to rush off when the man finally spoke. Score some talk cells, eh? I w want w words, it burst out of Anfred. You want words? Special words? Y yes I sell good words, strong words, lots of them, exclaimed the surprisingly articulate peddler, pulling out a paperback. Look at all this book, a full kilo, filled with real words, so much book, so good for you. He passed it to Anfred, who handed it right back. I, I need more stronger. The seller hesitated, grinned, and reached deep into his bag, producing a crumpled paper that he passed to Anfred. Awkwardly unfolding the sheet, Anfred read a few sentences. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I stood and looked down one as far as I could. Anfred convulsed. The dealer quickly snatched the note from him. Don't overdo it, man, you're a junkie. Anfred slowly composed himself and formed an astonishingly comprehensive sentence. I read a little every day. One of those, huh? Okay, man.
Anfred's eyes nervously followed the paper as it returned to the hawker's pocket. I'll buy it. Sure, man, he grinned, and his hand slid back into his sack. I may got some else for you. Might overload you, though, blast you into shock. The dealer studied Anfred's face as he produced a stack of hardboard cards. I, do do do, Anfred struggled. In, in, t, care, I got it. The peddler turned the first board without looking at it himself. It showed a detailed reproduction of Da Vinci's Last Supper. Anfred once again fell into convulsions, this time for longer. His knees gave out. He sagged. The dealer caught him and quickly hid the masterpiece. Like a man being electrocuted, Anfred jerked and shuddered, his every inch toiling in spasms. I want them, he shrieked despite his seizures. Both. All right, man, first time's free. Come back often. Anfred grabbed the wares, and without further words, he took off. Just when he turned a corner, the trafficker called him. Hey, friend, Anfred stopped. Maybe I got another thing, the hawker shouted as quietly as one can yell. Why are you buying street books? Anfred hesitated. I was a teacher once, but when I actually educated the children, they sent me to the doctor who prescribed TV to relax me. The next thing I knew, I'd lost my job and my home, Anfred said. How come you take on so much? Just forget all this crap, watch the TV, and get back to normal. I want to be clear and see the world for what it is. The dealer eyed Anfred suspiciously and then nodded. I might know some people of interest to you, you know, while you're clear. Now it was Anfred's turn to be suspicious. And what people are those? Here, the man handed him a pamphlet. We're organizing a group of like-minders. Why don't you stop by? Three. Jack Manny, a broad-bearing man toting virtually all the virtual medals of Thamerica, enjoyed the air of a retired military commander. Casmic skin, carefully disheveled hair for an image of the untamable, the non-conforming, a man of action who is too busy to groom, an aging rogue, or so Manny liked people to think, as his face was not marked by combat, but by lifelong debauchery. The uniform he had inherited from his old man, but he elected to leave the medals in place as a commemoration of his family's achievements, he claimed, though the politician didn't let that out unless asked. Manny casually entered a busy TV studio backstage area. Gaps in the set hinted at a courtroom spectacle being broadcast, with a sign reading Guile and Guilty. Raunchy O's and Ah's discharged from the audience in measured intervals. Manny barked into his communicator. Have the city's name changed to something sexier, he pondered. Manela, the brilliance made him grin. A shout broke his jubilation. Yo, my man, Gould was calling from afar. Manny disconnected. Good to see you, Donner, Gould saluted, then ran his eyes across Manny's crazed nest of hair. By the GM, how can a stately man bear such a hairstyle, he thought. On their first meeting, Gould had believed Manny to be blind or even a prole, so deep ran his belief that a man would not voluntarily bear such a coiffure. The two legislators exchanged smiles. How's Beth? Manny finally inquired. You know, Gould rubbed a fat spot on his muscle suit. I haven't seen her in a while. Manny nodded and touched his colleague's shoulder with spurious concern. I forgot. Did you remarry? Yeah, a college sweetheart, Gould said. Manny grinned. You've known her for a long time? No, she's in college. They burst into a cackle. Manny caught himself first. Are you joining us later? He asked, all business now. Eight, my place. The meeting? Naturally. You know, it's going to be terrific. Just then, a middle-aged woman with sharp facial features and inbred eyes joined the two politicians. She too wore visuig and stream suit, but had a leaner, more muscular physique than her male colleagues. Her arms were treated with implanted fiber optic thread, and her skin glistened with light. Such procedures took over 90 hours to complete. She demanded they do it in 10. This was Sandra Poling. Her visuig was even grander than Gould's, not merely flashing, but undulating anemoniously, as if caressed by invisible waves. A generous stratum of cosmetics covered her so thickly that her expressions couldn't always make their way through. Evening, she greeted the two men with a shark smile. A subordinate and two teenagers, a boy and girl, followed in Poling's toe absently dicking with their mobile bit buddies. Poling addressed the boy. Go want do more like, he frowned. I go things that tomorrow after. 
Poling answered her co-workers' questioning glances. I'm teaching them word salad, she continued. I heard there was going to be a treaty today. Yum! Before anyone could react, Poling turned to her subordinate. Ask me a warm-up question. The assistant scratched her beard. Your thoughts on Hamas? Poling frowned. Had it at an oriental restaurant. Didn't like it. The tentacles of her hair massaged her forehead. No, wait, we should not misunderestimate them. Happy with her performance, she went back to the kids. When we're on, she instructed her helper, Melissa will play the ping phone. Barry is not to pull down his pants. The assistant noted and nodded. Do not leave them alone together. You know what they'll do. She sighed and then addressed her colleagues. Let's go over tonight's show. All right, Manny said as he began to quiz her. What's your stance on health care? Don't know. What does the script say? Poling browsed the pages of the day's fake discussion. You agree with my viewpoint and vote for reductions. Then why did I vote against them before? Because you're a low-income loving liberal. Poling's hair swirled, mirroring her mind. But I'm a conservative. Not anymore. Manny loaded an earlier script. You switched parties when the angel visited you. Right. Stupid. Outright terrible, but you're wonderful, asserted Manny. Gould yawned. Erupting shouts pushed the legislators out of their rehearsal as a glob of fans bubbled up in the distance. Their guide noticed the polis and quickly walked the excited group down a loading chute. Cameras rose, flashes lit, and girls screamed. The stream suits still scrolled stupid and terrible. Ooh, the tour guide could barely contain herself. And here we have the stars of our show, Senators Poling, Manny, and Gould. The latter made a face. You know, why do you mention me last? A lady among the group thrust her hips at Manny. Not at all irritated, the Polly raised his arms and began to gyrate his oversized rump like a disturbed top. The woman winked. Another fan burst from the group, this time at Gould. Take my firstborn, she screamed. A collective gasp traversed the crowd. Gould nodded coolly, shook her hand, and then had her fill out the necessary paperwork. After everyone was given samples of Gould's hair, the handlers moved the crowd back down the bunt. Dang, did you see the teeth on that lass? Manny commented after the group was well ahead. You know, I nearly barfed. Gould thrust his stubby fingers up his throat. Polling seemed annoyed. I love my fans, real people from real homes, not like you two fakes. A bell and applause signaled the end of the previous show. Workers busily changed the decorations, switching the signage to Politicon's extreme decisions. A coordinator came running. You're up. The polis lurched toward a physicare, lovingly labeled Poly Pit Stop for a top up. Then the lights went blank. From the darkness rolled a rumbling blast beat, and with its crescendo, the lighting strobed back to life revealing a studio fitted as a parliamentary assembly with podiums towering in front of a crescent of desks that were populated with hooting suits. Behind the lawmakers rose lines of bleachers, separated by a chain-link fence and wrapped in razor wire. The cordoned-off rear zone was dark and packed with an undulating mass of bodies. Suddenly, a hand slammed into the barrier, then a foot. A face briefly pressed into the wire and was gone again in a flash. The space hissed and growled, Boom, boom, boom. A crack of thunder split the ether, and the show's host exploded onto the stage. Sturdy pistons gleamed between its finely anodized telunium chassis. All three polyjaws dropped at the sight of the slick robot. Yeah, Bill's a machine now, a coordinator said in passing. I mean, he was replaced by one. Better numbers. Gould made a move for the physicare, but was held back. The robot's well-fitted limbs nimbly glided about, the articulated hair lush and alive, the broad, stainless shoulders fittingly covered with a tuxedo and bow tie. It initiated speech. Everybody ready for discussion? The robo-raider smacked the air. An exchange of ideas? Constructive criticism? The machine bounded and leaped about, boxing invisible enemies. What do you say? It suddenly stopped, raising a hand to its ear-shaped microphone. Do you want to see democracy in action or just action? Boom, boom, boom. The crowd howled and hooted. The beats went to 11, with enough harmonic perturbations to burst any skull. The robot continued, log in or catch a buzz drone for today's episode of Politicons. Four, four. 
Boom, boom, boom. Numbed minds, blurred visions, the driving beats permeated everything. To withstand these conditions without vomiting required years of training, but even the polis barely held on. The gyroscopically stabilized robot, on the other hand, managed the vibrations with ease, as it had wisely received a generous bath of threadlocker that morning. Gould watched the elegant machine jealously. The thing seemed to read his mind and turn toward him. Did it wink at me? Gould felt dandruff vibrating out from under his wig. Boom, boom, boom. Prepare and beware. Here comes the senator, Donner Gould, blasted the machine. Boom, boom, boom. Will Gould's plan to unseat Manny explode, or will Manny explode? The audience roared, but when the pumped electorate began to gnaw through the fence, peace enforcement officers zapped them. The robot sensed the tension and initiated its spinning bow tie to humorously diffuse the situation. Bow titty spinny, they shouted. The proles pressed their faces into the fence until they bled. Gould was blasted onto the stage, stabbing air in all directions with each blow, thunder cracking. His hair flashed menacingly red as he stared down fantastical enemies. The crowd howled, pounding the fence and each other. Then, suddenly, darkness set in. The music and lights dimmed, transforming Congress into an oriental market with snake charmer mystique. The automatic announcer simulated a whisper. Will the mystifying polling spray her venom tonight? Upon this, polling emerged from the shadows, dangerously dancing forward, swaying left and right as if sneaking through an unseen forest. She was Medusa and Kali's baby, the Black Widow, the Cobra. Titty, titty, boing, boing. The proles had been anticipating this moment and chorused the memorized chant, an astounding feat. The host continued. Or will she stay in her basket, watching, lurking, and luring? Pauling's hair undulated enigmatically, when suddenly, bam! With a flash, the mood switched once more, and the she-Polly retired. The not-so-politic politician, the robot now shouted and swung its well-greased hips. The beast of brokering. The music changed. Just another manic manny, Manny roared onto the stage. Another? There's only one! He thrust his pelvis forward so hard that his pants burst at the crotch, and tinsel shot out. Like a great ape, the Polly leaped sideways, shaking and rubbing his head wildly as if fighting an infestation. He pounded his chest, challenging invisible enemies, thrusting his groin at anyone careless enough to look at it. A mime appeared and handed the frenzied legislator sheets of regulations, printed in huge letters for the audience to see. Manny didn't appreciate what he read and mauled them to shreds. Helpers rushed in, holding the poly back from charging Gould. And those are today's gladiators. Tough fighters for you, your country, your entertainment. Who's good? Who's bad? Find out on today's Politicons. Music and sound effects abruptly stopped. For a moment, only the ringing of the chain link fence remained, cut by growls and grunts from the proles. The spotlight returned to polling, who now stood behind a podium. Top news today. The naming authority has approved another 20 baby names, including really cute ones like Bolly Bob and Choo Choo, she exclaimed, beaming. The spotlight went to Gould, and he continued. Elections are coming up, so remember, if you see anyone stepping from a booth without a pleasure coupon, firmly tap their shoulder and ask why they threw away their vote. Remind them of the fun they missed by picking a representative rather than a prize, then report them to the authorities. The spotlight faded and the tunes returned. Laser holographs popped up and the polis were flung back to the arena. There were Nazis, commies, aliens, and poverty. The legislators fought them all. Gould shot pretend lightning, Manny thrust pelvic power, and polling spewed imagined poison. After all opponents were obliterated, suited foes materialized. Armed with bribes, they peddled favors and influence. The polis balked at the filthy money, annihilating the pushers to the spectators' rabid howls. Suddenly the music saddened, and a wheelchaired man rolled in. He wore rags, though they barely showed, so plentiful were the bandages all around his body. Gould stepped forward and, with moistening eyes, placed his hand on the man's forehead. Falling into a deep supernatural concentration, he channeled soothing powers into the cripple's every fiber. The man's torments vanished, and the paralytic leaped, frolicking and thrusting his legs skyward like a burlesque dancer. 
he joined the polis to dance in circles, shooting limbs and loins. And now it's time for the senators to take your calls, the host announced. The studio quieted in anticipation, and presently the voice of a young girl sounded from the speakers. Hi, Mrs. Pauling, if you were a tree, which tree would it be? That is a wonderful question, Pauling grinned. I'd be a birch. And you, Don? She looked at Gould, who answered quickly. Oak, big, strong, forever, oak. And you, Mr. Manny? Manny peeped up from his bit bud. Wolf! When he caught people's stares, he quickly corrected himself. Oh, trees, oak, yeah, oak. Another caller was put on. This time, though, instead of a voice, distorted rasping cut through the studio. Hello? Poling spoke up, listening intently. It seems like we're having technical problems. She smiled uneasily. Studio technicians shrugged at her gaze. Slowly, the guttural noise modulated into hoarse, distorted speech. Your bleeding society, starving minds, your election sis are a sham. Who are your masters? Poling raised her eyebrows. A storm is coming. With that, the oddly feminine voice ceased. Technicians had cut the call. The crazies again, Gould commented jovially. A storm? I say let it blow. My windows are sealed, triple sealed, in fact. Cost me a fortune, you know. The host quickly took over. And now it's time to announce today's winner. Who's our lucky one? Who will become president? The machine smirked at the kennel. I have a feeling that the one is already among us. Handlers led a heavily inked man from the cage to the politicons. Manny affectionately placed an arm around the restrained creature. Your Highness, he said while grinning sheepishly into the camera, what do you command? War! War! The freshly crowned ruler croaked. Poling shrieked, so strong and full of resolve. An oversized red button was rolled in and presented to the new pre -sident. His restraints were eased, and the handlers tensed on their cattle prods. When Manny guided the idiot's hand onto the button, red lights flashed and a dive siren blasted. Screens showed explosions over many lands. The president, now understanding the game, punched the knob repeatedly, each time loudly croaking to the chants of his caged buddies. A girl hung an edible medal around his neck, and the complimentary Thamerica tattoo was applied, his third. Finally, the Mad King was removed. And now, the vote for sexiest politician and the president. Five. On the following day, Manny found himself among a group of dignitaries in a state-run factory as the celebrity spectator. He had successfully navigated much of the event by pointing and smiling, but his attentiveness had started low. And now, the reek of cabbage and boredom fused into Manny's nostrils. Pauper smell, he thought with revulsion. If only there were a way to escape the lethargy of these assignments. Manny had heard of mind-altering substances that numb the senses while allowing an individual to function externally. His intellect would be locked away, entertaining itself, while the world had his body. An inquiry would be in order, Manny mused with a grin. Chomp, bang, toke. Desires whirled in his mind, an opaque vortex to devour any and all sensory input. And thus we are introducing this novel system for dressing the masses, injection clothing. Jan, the young woman representing the plant, beamed. Designed for effortless installation in polling prisons across the country. Manny's eyes wandered over her attractions, then veered off into an empty stare. Her words slurred, echoed, and turned to soup. He couldn't even focus on hot young chicks anymore, the politicon observed with regret. The girl continued. After pressing an easy single button, clothing spreads onto the citizen, imprinting care instructions right on the back. She held up a rubbery shell in the shape of a person, removable after three years for easy cleaning or fashion updates. She then operated a lever, closing two enormous human-shaped molds over a fearfully shivering naked man. The machine began to hiss and puff. Arm-thick hoses bounced under the pressure of the molten plasto resin shooting through. Searing liquid squirted from the edges of the cast, as did the occasional muffled screams from the person inside. The screeching woke Manny, and his eyes traveled back to the lass. She seemed vaguely familiar, her voice did, the intonation. Manny ogled her figure. 
Nice rack, he thought, before ending on a shoe she held. A left shoe. Do they only make left shoes? Manny idly gawked at her chest when he realized that all eyes were on him. Had she addressed him? Outstanding! Manny grinned and nodded, even pointing at the thing, a gesture that was always safe, but not this time. The gaping continued. He followed everybody's stares and realized that they led to his suit. He looked down. It scrolled, nice rack. Oh, did that come out aloud? He fumbled the suit's controls. Forgot to activate the voice filtering. The injection machine opened with an overloud hiss. Inside was the prospect, melted clothing combined with his form, a shirt and pants sort of covering him. When he plunged from the apparatus, his pants ripped instantly, with streaks of steaming plastic oozing off like melted cheese. The presenter stayed excited. Doesn't that look so cute? What if the person doesn't fit the mold? A bystander asked. We'll make it fit, replied the girl, no less smiling. The individual, not the cast. The crowd moved on to reach an elevator. It was too small for the group, and Manny cleared a path for their guide, gallantly escorting her in. Once she was inside, he quickly stepped after her but remained at the closing door to block it. You speak well, he remarked, running his eyes all over her as if words were seeping from her pores. I've received twelve years of schooling, Jan replied, her eyes evading his. You sound familiar, Manny continued. I want to swear I've heard your voice before. Suddenly, all confidence seemed to drain from the girl, and she stepped nervously from foot to foot. I'm Jag Price's daughter. A flash of recognition hit Manny. Old Jag, the Jaguar. Yes, I'll be damned. How's that venerable man doing? He's doing great. The girl showed relief, but Manny caught none of it. The empire ever growing. Manny now saw clearly. That's why he'd recognized her, of course. It had been a while since he'd seen her. She'd grown into her body nicely. And how are you doing, Mr. Manny? Jan asked. Besides the politicons? You know, Jan, I'm trying to focus on what's truly important in life. Working less while getting a full government paycheck and pension. Spending more time with your many loved ones and things. He paused, his face returning to an ever-widening grin. Listen, Jan, perhaps we'll do an episode of Politicons here to show appreciation for your achievements. The girl beamed. And bring all the Politicons here? Manny nodded. That'd be great for us, she said, and began to eagerly type on her communicator. Manny enjoyed his dumb score, observing the girl as she texted. Are you messaging people about me? He exposed his big square teeth in what he thought was a smile. You be sure I am? Jan responded with a smirk. The doors opened. They had arrived at a new level and a new section of the factory. The delegation had found their way up the stairs and was waiting as Manny and Jan stepped out into the troll forest, an area filled with desks, screens, and mail operators. The walls had been adorned with an uplifting slogan. Truth is what you make it. Manny ran his eyes across the ocean of desks and screens. I'm surprised that trolling is still done by hand, he remarked now back to his professional demeanor. It sure is, Mr. Manny. AIs, it turns out, cannot be as annoying or devious as human computer freaks. Manny knew this was true, of course. Although we are making progress on our robo-trolls, Jan pointed at an iron humanoid in front of a screen, softly mumbling to itself. Manny thought of their new Politicon's host and shuddered. We've got their essence down, Jan continued, all the way to the dandruff. She proudly brushed the machine's shoulders, but then she turned pensive. Although production is running into problems, after years of automation and layoffs, no one can afford to buy the things we produce. Manny nodded and pointed. A very real problem. Thus, Jan continued, the committee advised us to manufacture consumers. A very good solution. But now we must increase production of goods and require additional workers. A devilish cycle. Jan now looked Manny straight in the eyes. Have you recently fabricated anything, Mr. Manny? The Polly responded with a statesman smile. It is well known that we politicons carefully craft our language in order to make an impact, he pursed his lips. But all statements are thoroughly reviewed by the committee. For the best of Thamerica. Certainly, Mr. Manny, we also test each lie that this factory produces before it leaves the facility. Manny nodded. Impressive. They came to a vast manufacturing space filled with rows of desks. 
The overall bleakness of the place was oddly broken by the long tablecloths with which the workstations had been adorned. At this time, Jan said while lifting one of the rags, I'd like to divulge the very uncute working conditions in this factory. She revealed what initially appeared as a bundle of discarded clothes carelessly tossed under the table, but was in fact a family of five living there. Fascinating, hollered Manny. This is where the common man lives. This is what he calls home. Such heroes. He smiled broadly, then turned to Jan. Are they proles? No, Mr. Manny, this is the Kaw family. They have been displaced by government oil drilling in their house. The family even attempted to stay during the boring, but were eventually vibrated out. Manny, much to Jan's astonishment, grinned. Incredible. Jan, I must confess that I've been waiting for this moment. Jan didn't like Manny's smug expression, and the nervousness from the elevator returned to her face. It passed by Manny unnoticed. Labor's hardships have been a concern of mine for some time. He signaled an aide. Suddenly, a roaring arose over the factory, rattling the roof and windows. Dust and detritus shot from cracks all around. Manny casually produced a handkerchief, covered his mouth, and then gestured the delegation toward a window. Outside, hurricane winds raged and workers scuttled, while a humongous shadow blackened the grounds. Jan watched incredulously as a giant chopter came into view and lowered a monumental statue of Manny into what used to be their turnip gardens. It's my way of saying thank you, the cheerful Manny remarked. I know this wonderful idol will fill the hearts of workers with strength for generations to come. This is not a America, it's the America. He paused for the inevitable applause before continuing. I do require everyone to forfeit lunch for a decade, though, to cover expenses. 6. Don Gould's chopter sped across town, high above the bustling metropolis of 60 million. The sun was just setting, and Gould enjoyed its sparkle across the vast ocean of shimmering metallic structures. Golden buildings. Why did it feel as though he had seen this before? A jerk shoved the poly out of his ruminations. The chopter had landed on the roof of the 400-story apartment tower where Jack Manny's festivity was set to happen. Gould exited the slick vehicle and, in an atypical impulse of curiosity, went to the edge of the building to gaze at the soup of life below. He shook his head. Anything lower than the penthouse is a sewer, he mused and spat. The dinner party was attended by dozens of formally dressed guests. Visitors and decorations were embellished with gold, so undiluted that it shone with luminescence. One hundred quatrefoil panels detailing Manny's ancestry greeted the attendees in the entry hall. Behind it, intricate wallpaper depicted the great deeds of the Manny family in times past and present. All windows were 24K electroplated, transforming any time of day into a golden sunset. The floors, also crafted from gold, were too slick for normal footwear, and the guests were given nanosuction slippers for additional grip. In the distance, a screen ran a commercial featuring Gould holding a bar of sparkling soap. Enjoy the same high-powered lifestyle as Politicon Donner Gould with his enthralling soap magnet. TV Gould grinned widely before commenting on the cleaning block. The lawyers won't let me say what the soap is a magnet for, but I'll tell you this. You'll get a lot of put. Someone had switched the channel. The real Gould entered and found himself facing a wall of books. Words of Forever by Jack Manny, the covers said. Gould picked one up and contemplated it grimly. The sudden sound of clanging from behind made him turn. There stood Manny, covered entirely in medals chest, legs, arms, and neck. He hadn't a single spot that wasn't gleaming. Even for Gould, this was too much. He sighed. Evening, a cheery Manny hollered. You didn't bring your wife? You know, of course not. Gould's irritation increased. That's like taking bread to the baker. Listen, are you releasing this crap, words of forever? He waved the book in his colleague's face. Why, yes, replied Manny curiously. What the heck, man? I'm releasing words of eternity in a week, Manny pondered. Why don't you change your title to eternal words, he suggested while preparing a drink. Gould shook his head. That sounds long and boring, which it is. You've read it, Manny interrupted, handing his workmate a cocktail. No. Do you know what it's about? Fitness, I believe. Gould pulled up his muscle pants, which had slipped below his fat belly. 
Manny nodded and veered to the buffet. What can I get you? Care to try this new specialty? He gestured at a bowl overflowing with golden translucent pills, then picked one up with a pair of tweezers. The shiny lozenge glistened translucently as Manny contemplated it. The essence of a hundred animals extracted through an advanced osmosis system, he explained, setting the magical capsule down on a tiny plate and offering it to Gould. Gould stared at the gimmick dispassionately. None of this modern nonsense for me. I want the finest part of the animal as we've always had. Filet mignon, fugu liver. I'm not even hungry. I just want them on my plate. But of course, Donner. Oh, fugu, so lethal, yet here we are, devouring you safely. He grabbed a spoon and loaded both men's plates with it. Just then, a vital-looking lady in her 60s, Josine Mackerel, approached the politicians. Jack, is anything in your house not made of gold? She inquired with a noticeable accent. My heart. Manny grinned and kissed her hand. But humor aside, he continued, when my architect mentioned the golden ratio, I said, yes, make everything golden. Mackerel smirked. Let me introduce you to Terence Tweet, my colic, she then said, as a tall, dark gentleman stepped forward. Tweet, a man in impeccable attire, examined Manny's medals, then his hair. How do you do? He asked, politely bowing. Jack Manny, good to meet you. From the European program? Indeed, two decades running. Impressive. Manny seemed genuinely interested. We're growing weary of our democratic utopia, Tweet said, looking Gould and Manny over, and are seeking inspiration. We're love to learn, say, intricacies of your regime, Mackerel interjected. Tactics, techniques, we are hoping to include cruelty in particular. Naturally, asserted Manny. We have recently added a service that may interest you. Our police now also deliver packages. As so many people are arrested, it was a logical step. Fascinating, Tweet nodded pensively. But don't you have problems with a rebellion? He gestured at the teletiles where the news showed riots. Peace enforcement is on it, Gould cut in dismissively, though I wouldn't mind handling those punks myself. He pulled up his pants and a whiff of air discharged. But listen. Do you think we could arrange my special appearance on your program? The two Europeans exchanged glances. We will certainly consider it, Tweet finally replied. Opens up great opportunities, said Gould as the corners of his mouth began to leak. For instance, imagine the millions of people worshipping me and wanting some Gould for themselves. How do you mean? asked Tweet, glancing across Gould's squeezy figure. When so many adore you, you're every atom. Shouldn't those very fibers be accessible to them? I suppose so, Tweet replied with a shrug. Imagine, Gould's gaze shifted afar, high-end clothing, embroidered with Gould hair clippings to make them more durable, prettier, smell better, or simply to add value. He paused, waiting for an approving nod from his counterparts before continuing. The air I expel, collected and sold in bottles to cure ailments and bring good fortune. This is most definitely a novel idea, Mackerel interrupted. Excuse us. She dragged Tweet off. Gould continued to muse. Often I find that my mere touch can heal or destroy, give or take life. When he found that even Manny had ceased listening, he emptied his glass and went to watch the news. As a wave of protest against corrupt government engulfed 30 cities worldwide. Gould pondered. Upheaval? How did this fit into the GM's plans? He shrugged. In the distance, Poling entered, her makeup as thick as her costume, her hair raised into a tall, twisted affair. Manny and Gould gawked as she strode toward them. Gah, the new gal again? Gould stabbed the air. I think she's hot, said Manny, playing with his tongue. Just look at those meaty thighs. Too old, Gould observed. They hushed as Poling walked up to them. Hi, have you guys seen the reports on the uprisings? She said, chirping. More trouble, more discussion, more money, Manny answered, grinning. They cackled, but then Manny took on a more serious tone. Great performance today, Sandra. Thank you. Redneck diva to city queen in less than two years. I'm hoping to play president one day. I wish you the best. He kissed her hand. Gould snorted and shuffled to the buffet. Jack. What attracted you to the mire of politics? Poling asked. 
I aimed for a profession where careless actions hold no consequences for yourself and one that allows you to lie and lie and lie. That part fascinated me as well, admitted Pauling. But I also wanted a line of work with lots of exposure. Manny nodded. When my father gave me the choice of a generalship or a senate seat, I chose the latter, he said, his gaze distant. I enjoyed the idea of ordering people around, even sending them to their deaths. But why limit yourself to just a few regiments when you can command an entire country? He took a handful of golden lozenges and shoved them all into his mouth at the same time. And I just love making stuff up, he added, chewing widely. I wish I could have experienced the old days of government, Poling said as her hair began to undulate like a great flame, when people still believed in their government without zone drones or ear zonk. We're too great a country to allow people to think as they please. Remember, it's not just a America, it's the America. They took a sip of golden wine, and Manny continued, pulling back the corners of his mouth. Sandra, is this your first time meeting the GM? Now Poling's hair began to whirl like a great school of fish, with all strands attempting to reach the interior. Yes, I'm nervous. Don't be. I'm here with you. He exposed his great teeth even more. What's it like talking to him, huh? Upon hearing this, Manny's grin vanished. Nobody knows whether the GM is a man or a woman, and it's best not to ask. I've heard that there's a special announcement tonight. Do you know anything about it? No, but the GM never assembles us this way. The fact that there are foreigners among us carries great significance. He pursed his lips and then rubbed one of his medals. Did you know that I, now Manny looked over his shoulder, have a special relationship with the GM? You do? He nodded, his eyes pinned on polling. She was enthralled. I'd do anything to get closer to the GM. I know, Manny said quietly, just as Gould returned to them. You seem tense tonight, Donner. Here, this will cheer you up. He led his colleagues to a table richly decorated with intricate golden butterflies. Gould stared at them dispassionately. Yeah, golden, nice. Let's trigger the butter lies. It'll relax you, Manny said with a grin. Butter, lies? Flies, of course, Manny chuckled. It came so naturally. He picked up one of the decorations and placed it on his hand. Upon closer inspection, the insect was an intricate little machine a marvel of design and engineering. When Manny touched its center, the critter came to life, fluttering its wings and then undulating in fantastic colors before finally lifting off. The two men regarded it, and soon other guests caught the attraction, launching their own until the room was filled with them. The butterflies rise and so should your spirit, proclaimed Manny as attendants with shiny plates entered, each holding a tiny golden gun. Manny offered one to Gould, grabbed a pistol himself, and then began firing randomly at the butterflies. Soon, the first machine was hit, uttering a despairing screech before spiraling down to its doom. Gould joined in, and his mood brightened. Now, other guests eagerly picked up guns or threw random decorations at the tiny flying miracles until they crashed. The lighthearted enjoyment was harshly interrupted when a thundering voice broke from each and every electronic speaker in the house. To the screen. All attendants jerked and jumped into action, eager to please the voice, dropping anything anywhere to rush to a nearby darkened room. The windowless space was devoid of furniture except for an enormous circular screen where undulating patterns of dots swirled like flocks of excited birds. Silence hung deep only broken by fans somewhere at the back of the device, undulating at measured intervals. Countless polis had lined up in front of the display, and one by one they bowed to it. A robed attendant offered screws and bolts from a cyborium, which the participants tossed over their shoulders before kneeling at the screen to kiss it. Upon each smack, the machine's fans breathed heavily, while the display's pixels swarmed excitedly around the person's lips. Poling found herself staring. The colorful motions dizzied her. This must be what those zone drones feel like, she thought. While she had not often seen the machines that crowded the lowest levels of the city, she knew enough to suspect that the same technology was at work here. She shuddered at the thought of being controlled like the proles. When everyone had honored the screen, 
The voice continued. Welcome, and thank you for heeding my invitation. The benign words hardly hid the power of its intonation. Special gratitude to Jack Manny for hosting us tonight. No one dared speak. The fans purred. After generations of you faithfully serving me, my stratagem will soon culminate. This is your achievement. Take a moment and applaud yourselves. The Paulus knew well how to do this. The screen continued. You may reduce your vigilance, for we will soon reach the threshold. Complete and irreversible control is within our grasp. The sham of voting can cease. The group applauded heartily, but the GM wasn't done. You have served me well and shall be richly rewarded. The voice allowed a round of applause. Yet, remain wary of the youths. Their unfinished minds stand far too open. We must ensure their appetite is filled with our designs only. The room nodded eagerly. Therefore, I ask you to return to school. The group gasped, but the GM quickly added, Not to study, but to inspire. The attendants sighed with relief. Make it so, for it is my will, boomed the voice, and the room hummed with its reverberation. The intricately swarming dots on the screen whirled into cascading circles, then collected and shot apart to vanish. The participants remained bowed for several more minutes before they dared to rise. Gould shrugged but couldn't help gazing pensively at the screen. Is it time to quit? 6. Power had failed, and darkness engulfed the city's mid-levels, with sporadic flames casting a nervous light from pockets of burning rubbish. Upheaval had raged across the city, and thick smoke rose from cars and stores. Menacing shadows danced within those clouds, cast by masked figures rushing between them. There were indistinct chants echoing among buildings as scores of rioters and the peace enforcement engaged in street fights, a sight unseen in living memory. Zone drones swarmed the sky, eager to flash suspecting or unsuspecting victims alike. Following the hustler's pamphlet, Anfred plodded through these dangerous and endless alleys. The note only bore vague instructions, but somehow Anfred knew his way. Stay clear of the foam, a voice suddenly said. It sounded close, and Anfred dashed to hide, but no one was near. Dread gripped him. Had it been in his head? Anfred swore that he had heard the voice aloud through his ears. Deja Ecute came to his mind. What did that mean? Anfred moved on, and after a few more minutes, an open space spread out ahead of him. Far away, fading into smoke and darkness, stood numerous mounds, among them what appeared to be a humanoid figure. Anfred froze, but the distant person didn't move either, causing Anfred to cautiously advance. Closing in, he found that the human outline was part of a mound, a person encased in a hardened material of sorts. The mound was clean, and had only sprung to life a few hours earlier. Anfred knocked on it, but received no response. He now noticed similar figures all around the plaza. A riot graveyard. Head toward Funjoy Square, the voice urged him. Anfred did not question it. Reaching the location, he rested. This was the place described in the pamphlet. What in the world had he come here for? In no turning back now, he recognized his own stuttering thoughts. Change wouldn't come by itself. He rested, preparing for whatever awaited him. Anfred passed time by catching the ever-present bits of floating garbage and reading discarded wrappers like he did as a kid. He remembered his mother making toys and clothing out of garbage and dreaming of the glorious things the garbage once held. You here to break stuff? A hoarse voice suddenly barked, a voice not imagined. Anfred shot up and around. A single, grinning, and rugged-looking man stood in front of him. Uh, are we g going on a mission or sesu sumi thing? Uncertain as to what he had expected, Anfred was sure it hadn't been this. Don't know nothing about missions, but smashy, replied the man and handed Anfred a brick. Anfred took it and contemplated the large red block, assessing its weight. It lay well in his hand. What to do wo with the this? He asked his co-rioter, who had begun whacking the crap out of some car windows. Toss it, 
But wh why and wh where? Best use it on glass. Anfred lifted the brick, exhausting most of his strength as he hadn't heaved anything in ages, then tossed the block at a media storefront, right into the midst of two Gould and Manny stand-ups. The polis toppled, and Anfred shook with a surge of power. His masked buddy nodded approvingly. T this feels g g great Anfred shouted, incredulously looking at his hand, a newfound tool for the release of frustration. Know what you mean? hollered his chum and punched him in the face. Sorry, a reflex, he grinned. Once you get the juices flowing, right? Totally understand, Anfred said, bleeding and beaming. But aren't we pro-elections? The rioter looked at Anfred sideways. Your speech. At first, Anfred didn't comprehend, but the rioter had made a valid observation. Anfred's stutter was gone. Suddenly, dark, well-geared figures pushed through the smoke in the distance, and Anfred's buddy took to his heels. Why are you running? Anfred yelled after him. He was determined to hold his ground, intent on making the fight his. He paused, raised his fists, and then rushed toward the enemy. Crush them, he would. Everything they represented. Peace enforcement, though, didn't budge. Instead, a massive hose snaked out from the armored wall of law, and a gooey shower shot toward Anfred, though it left the lone quarreler undeterred. He ran with the fervor of a crazed primate and was quickly joined by a swarm of zone drones flashing viciously on his heels. But Anfred's mind didn't register them. For this fleeting moment, he was free. He possessed the power to do as he pleased, and he would use it. When peace enforcement's riot foam hit him, that energy slowed, yet Anfred dragged onward through the molasses, leaving an imprint of his struggle behind. The officers, meanwhile, operated their gear blindly as the flashing drones had increased their activity beyond anything endurable by man. Only after numerous minutes did they dare to reestablish vision. They found a solidified mound of Anfred just a few steps ahead of them, his form recognizable only through the outstretched fists. He's finished, the officers agreed, and with a satisfied chuckle, retrieved their gear. The drones flashed a few callous extra strobes before everyone vanished and the scene quieted. Abandoned and encapsulated but alive, Anfred wondered how long he could survive this way. When his oxygen began to run low, colors entered his darkness. This was surely the end, but the rookie rioter had no regrets. He'd made his voice heard, if only for a few minutes of his life. Anfred patiently waited to die. Instead of death, footsteps approached, then whispers. Surely he imagined them. There was the pop of a lid, a gurgle of liquid, and a hiss. Acrid smoke entered Anfred's prison. It hurt to cough. Unbelievably, his situation had worsened. He passed out. Anfred awoke some time later, not knowing how much he had missed. He felt that his head and eyes were bound. Pressure on his body indicated that he was only partially enfoamed now, but when he forced his headdress off, his eyes were pierced by smoke. Keep that on for a bit longer, buddy, an unfamiliar voice advised him. Anfred complied. In his brief moment of vision, he'd made out a group of masked men. Fellow rioters, he figured. They wore bandanas over their mouths and were pouring a liquid over his encasement. The stuff dissolved the foam, an acid perhaps. Anfred heard more splashing and then suddenly felt cold drops touching his skin. He freaked. W w watch out! Don't worry, man. It only dissolves the foam, a muffled voice replied. Who are you guys? We are the resistors! The flow stopped. There were shouts and unrest. They're coming! Get the suckers! Someone yelled. Anfred's uneasiness arose once more, and after removing his blindfold, he observed a massive swarm of buzz drones approaching. An imposing man, the rebel's commander, Anfred assumed, stepped to the front and glanced with concern at the swirling dots. He whistled, and men with backstrapped apparatuses appeared, thick hoses protruding from them. The commander noticed Anfred's questioning glance. These were intended to reduce garbage when people collected it rather than dumping it on the lower levels. They suck and shred, he grinned. We've found a new use for them. Anfred marveled at the engineering. M Amazing what we used to arch, Eve. <sighs> How are these machines built these did DAs? The resistor looked at him knowingly. A good question. 
I work at a factory and we haven't produced anything useful in decades. I'm convinced that even the higher-ups aren't certain where or how stuff comes into being. Some say foreign lands produce everything, but I don't believe it. I think it's something more sinister. Sin... Nister? Anfred was confused. What's m... m... Ysterious about Manu? Facturing? The commander laughed. Everybody is so stupid without skills or knowledge. Been that way for generations, yet we have flying cruise ships and megacities. There must be science centers somewhere for development, engineering, and all that. He returned his glance to the approaching drone storm and then turned to his comrades. All ready? The geared men nodded. Can we get him out of here? He gestured at Anfred. The man with the acid canister shook his head. Then a powerful whining began to fill the air, and the flying machines relentlessly flashed at the rebels. Any zone drone careless enough to come within the men's reach was drawn in and came out of the sucker's tailpipe in pieces. After laboring for the better part of an hour, none of the drones had survived. Having never encountered resistance, they weren't programmed to flee. The crew had scarcely drawn breath when a message arrived. The commander read it quietly, shaking his head. They're gonna turn on the acid. We must go. He signaled his men. Anfred wasn't panicked. T that'll get me out of the FF foam faster, right? He asked, rather hopeful. The commander shook his head. Not their acid. It comes from spigots across the roofs, and that stuff will dissolve people. Probably won't touch your foam at all. Anfred nodded. H how did, do you know all this? Our intel is always dead on. We have a snitch. He looked up. No more chatting. Men with sledgehammers and chainsaws arrived. Anfred's eyes passed over his opaque enclosure and then back to the resistor's tools. He freaked. D do you know wh where to cut? Sure, don't be a baby, a ruffian with a hacksaw replied. The man revved his machine and grinned. Anfred wondered if the acid wouldn't be a more merciful death. Yet the workers were gentler than he had expected, and after ten minutes, they hadn't made much progress. We gotta have to leave him, the Sawyer informed his commander not too quietly. The leader looked up. Not yet, keep going. The man wasn't pleased. It'll come any second now. But the rain didn't appear, and when they finally freed Anfred, he felt reborn. There was no time for celebrations, though, and they rushed him into an empty store. It appears that our mighty friend has once again aided us, the commander said, looking up and grinning. That'll piss off peace enforcement. Mighty friend, asked Anfred. Our insider doesn't just supply information, he manipulates, saved our asses more than once. Who within the government would do that? Nobody knows. His or her identity is unknown. But we should go. Go? Where? Return to HQ and you're coming with us. Someone dragged a sock over Anfred's head. 7. After a long and quiet march, Anfred suddenly perceived distant voices. The unit stopped. The others must have heard them also. Uh, are we still in the city? Anfred asked. Shh! Someone dragged him sideways and into a crouch. A faraway voice bellowed. Did you watch Bang Bang on the head last night? Yeah, good banging that was, another answered. Hear about the foam guy? Sure did. Wish them rioters weren't so weak and dumb, though. Too easy to fight them. Probably didn't have their morning's TV. Right, heh <laughs> heh. Anfred tugged on his head sock, and now he saw the two stout men in P.E. uniforms loitering at a building labeled P.E.H.Q. A dark fear gripped his heart. Why had they led him here? He tried to pull himself away, but the rebels held him back. You weren't supposed to see this, the rebel commander whispered. Our headquarters are right next to P.E. Nothing to worry about, okay? He pulled off Anfred's blindfold. They'd never expect us here. Look, the P.E. officer continued. I got one of the new XP-35S. He produced a handgun and showed it to his colleague. Awesome, the man marveled at the arm. Aren't those releasing floaters into the target's body in search of pain? Suddenly, another man came running out of the building. Sir, Dum Dome 7 has failed, sir. We must get right to it, the taller of the men said. I feel smarter already. The P.E.s rushed inside. Let's move, the rebel commander ordered. 
The group entered the building and then followed winding flights of stairs down. It got cooler, and the city's noise died down. Deep in the bowels of the building, the resistors dumped Anfred into a dim, concrete room. What now? he asked, unsure whether to be more intimidated by peace enforcement or the rebels. Our leaders want a word. Wait here, the commander said and left with a nod. It became quiet. Heavy exhaustion gripped Anfred. A muffled conversation from somewhere in the building spilled through the walls, and the dreary mumble soothed him. Smeared, encrusted, and exhausted, Anfred nodded off. When he woke, he could not tell how much time had passed, but the conversation nearby had turned into an argument. Re Sisters would be a much cuter name, a beautifully feminine voice shouted. Yes, you said that earlier, and yesterday, and the day before, an agitated man replied. But we're not all girls. Remember who's in charge, she yelled, or go and fund your flock of flea bags yourself. The girl's voice jingled in Anfred's ears despite the harsh words. He rose and was surprised to find his door unlocked. He strode down a deserted hallway toward the voices. There was no one to stop him, and after only a few seconds, he entered the room where the argument took place. Ye, you're b both resisting the g-g-government. Why are you fighting each other? Anfred was surprised to hear himself say. Who are you? The girl asked from the shadows. Ooh, you're that guy we've rescued from the foam. That was so cool, right? Anfred nodded and shook his head simultaneously. We're from different sides of the political spectrum, she continued. Bronk here is from the right. I'm leaning left. Anfred shot a glance at Bronk and realized he'd met him. He was the peddler from the alley. I di didn't realize such things ex existed, Anfred stammered. They do, in the underground. But let's get back to you. My men tell me you stood up to peace enforcement unlike anyone they've seen. Are you brave or a fool? F fool, Anfred replied. This made the girl laugh. And you speak well. Who are you? Anfred saw no purpose in lying. My name is Anfred Abwehr. I was an educator. The dark lady stepped forward and into the light. Anfred's eyes widened from a beauty they had never beheld golden hair flowing in perfectly symmetrical waves, like strings of fresh hemp. He noticed her ears, so unlike the cabbage leaves people on the mid-levels had. Clear eyes, saturated and intelligent, like polished turnips, shone in her face. Her skin radiated fairly, but not too fairly, as it had received just the right amount of light and lotion. The girl must have been nearing her thirties, yet looked fresh and relaxed, with clothes clean and tailored to her pleasant form. It was Jan, the girl from the factory. Anfred fell back into his stutter. Your anonymous bean factor, why did, do you trust him? The resistors exchanged glances. How, well, initially we didn't, but we've gained great insights over time. The trust built slowly. It didn't come overnight. Are you interested in joining? Bronk asked. Your every action will be scrutinized. Certainly, Anfred said firmly and without a stutter. You'll have to give up a lot, your entire life, Jan pondered while rubbing her beard. I have no life, said Anfred. I think with treatment, his mental capacity will return, Bronk said, studying Anfred's face with an intensity that made Anfred uncomfortable. I'm good with languages. A teacher, right? That was part of why I liked you. Bronk said, rubbing his clean chin. He could lead our educators. He's more cohesive than even our finest teachers and could get our companions back to normal faster. Jan nodded. Excellent idea. I'll send this to my followers right away. Me too, exclaimed Bronk. They typed away on their communicators. After a moment, Bronk looked up. Actually, it'd be best if we sent one unified message to all. Yes! Let's do that on all chat, Jan replied cheerily. I don't have all chat, only US chat. US chat has a 33 word limit. My message is 42 words, Jan opined, reaching for Bronx's device. The man jerked back. Not true, US chat allows between 39 and 54 words, but limits colors to blue, mauve, and yellow. Well, my font is black. Then it won't work. 
What about meso message? Does your writing include words such as it, me, so, why, time, or rattle? He checked. Yeah, um, it does. Then it's not gonna work. What can we do? They grew desperate. W why not use your voices? Anfred injected himself shyly. The voice of the people. Fantastic, that's why you're our chief educator, shouted Jan. We shall have a grand meeting. Eight. Many of the Resistance's supporters found their way into the secret underground compound the next day. A girl at the entrance handed out complimentary t-shirts and vitamins, designed to rebuild the physical as well as the mental strength of the rebel force and make them look great. Among the gray, decrepit attendees arose a tall man of a well-nourished physique, his vivid skin radiating with confidence. He stepped boldly into the dark entryway, then paused, an air of confusion about him. Can I help you? The receptionist inquired. Is this the peace enforcement? The girl laughed. No, this is the HQ of the resistance, quite the opposite. She hadn't taken her vitamins that morning. P.E. is right next door. Terribly sorry. The man bowed. I'm new to this sector. He looked around the place, baffled. I've never heard of this. Resistance, the girl interjected. He laughed. Resistance of yours. No biggie. Here, have a complimentary vitamin. She handed him a pill. The officer contemplated the green capsule. Thanks, he smiled, but before popping it, he continued. You know, in the PE, we have cyanide capsules just like this. Now do you? The girl replied, laughing out loud. No matter, he said. I'd better be on my way. Have a good one, said the girl, beaming. Oh, and send our guys over. They're stupid and always end up at your office. Sure thing, the friendly officer replied as he popped the pill on his way out. A moment later, the girl's supervisor came. Don't hand out the green pills, they're cyanide. Down in the bowels of the headquarters, Jan and Anfred prepared to address the crowd. The girl looked like she'd just risen from a soft, warm bed, and she had. Her skin shone with moisture, and she covered it only lightly with a subtle layer of makeup before moving on to brush the undulating flow of golden hair that streamed from the well of her head. Anfred looked like he'd spent the night among spoiled vegetables in the cellar, and he had. Chunks of decaying matter, as well as dead insects, were tangled in his knotted hair. Seen happy, happy baby baby last night? Jan quizzed Anfred while her eyes tracked a cabbage fragment on his shoulder. Now, was that a surprise ending or what? She flicked the bit off with her finger. Anfred took a bite of turnip and stared at her blankly. E you have a television? Yeah, two in my chambers. One in the boudoir, one in the drawing room. Wah, where's home? Anfred said, tottering and licking his cracked lips. Upper Shamptons, said she while applying lip gloss. Chopter picked me up. Look, I had this really cute logo designed. Her soft hands passed Anfred a piece of paper. It smelled of jasmine and showed the rising fist of the resistance. Each fingernail was adorned with a pattern of stars. Aren't those nails adorable? All gold sparkles on silver backing, she said. Anfred nodded and shook his head in all possible ways before Jan dragged him off to the stage where a sizable crowd had assembled. While she contemplated the gray mass of bodies, she tightly held the shivering Anfred near her. Not too much attention was to go to him. This was her moment, so exciting. When she finally thrust up her fist, the horde responded with a forest of clenched hands and thundering applause. Once the roar ebbed, she addressed her followers. When I started our movement, I just wanted to teach Daddy a lesson, she beamed. But now we've been outlawed in all 19 districts. She applauded, herself mostly. How far we've come. This was the once in a lifetime event she'd casually worked a few hours for. When this was over, they'd all get vaporized. She'd receive no dessert for a week. Tonight, you won't be slurping cabbage. A few soup eaters coughed. You'll be feasting on radish. Jan raised her fist to another roaring applause. Clenched hands shot up across the room as helpers tossed turnips to the masses. Jan danced around the stage like an elf. Anfred stood frozen and needed the bathroom. The girl let the applause play out and then continued. Is it right that voting prisons detain you based on your ballot? Confused shouts. Yes. No. 
she let the incertitude sink in and then proceeded. In a system called democracy, people used to vote for whomever they chose. And then what happened? shouted the crowd. The most voted for person became elected, Jan shouted in return. Muddled murmuring filled the room. Soon, Jan resumed, many government positions will need filling. I am going to play president. Any other volunteers? Multiple hands were raised. Jan pointed at the first fellow, who had one finger in the air and one up his nose. I want to be mister of the exterior. Very well, noted Jan. And you? She nodded toward another volunteer. I is gonna be president of school Ang. Yeah, sure. She took down his name. Another resistor raised his voice. I be's the president of everything. I'm already doing that, Jan said, smacking her lips. She stopped taking names. It was Anfred's turn. Sweat ran down his back. He craved a soothing bite of radish. But when he stared into the dull, empty faces of his audience, he saw himself and found the same courage he'd mustered the day before on the streets. W we have multiple exiting lectures scheduled today, he began. A retired P.E. will speak on destruction from his essay, Violence is What You Make It. He looked at the sparkling Jan next to him smiling but unmoved. He felt a surge of energy within him and continued. There's also a special guest, a European speaker from Dystopians Without Borders. He went on and on. Most attendees had dozed off, but Anfred's enthusiasm wouldn't cease. Suddenly, all were jolted back to the here and now when every speaker in all electronics sprang to life and spoke with roaring thunder. Dear friends, the crowd twitched, some screeched, Workshops are not enough. You must force your will upon the enemy. Who are you? Show yourself, yelled Yan, her fists raised once more. We're not afraid to fight. She couldn't help smiling. This was so much fun. Good, but you need not fight me, for I am a friend. I shall assist you, as I did with the sprinklers. The mysterious benefactor. Jan kneaded her beard nervously. The great dumbing has not only affected the populace, but the elite as well. I knew it, Anfred shouted. Jan snapped her fingers. Was that so? She'd always thought herself pretty smart, and she didn't appreciate Anfred's glance. Your leaders are incapable of rational thought, owing to decades of ignorance passed down from generations prior. Jan rubbed her hands nervously. In a few short days, the country will reach a vital dumbing threshold. Past it, there is no return to normal civilization, ever. A panicked murmur rose. The voice quickly extinguished it. You must disable the propaganda. You must bring the country under control. You must apprehend the politicons. Ha, uh, how do you suggest we go about to tea this? Anfred yelled into the room. I shall impel all arrangements, roared the speakers, and with that the oracular voice quieted. 9. The crowded school auditorium was filled with worn furniture and worn kids. They were hoarded into the cramped space hours ago and had been waiting silently since. Out of nowhere, the door flew open and polling blasted in with great fanfare, playing through speakers in her suit. Hidden contraptions sprayed flower petals along the Polly's path, while outside a flag with her crest was raised. A teacher quieted the room. Before we begin, children, drink your school aid. The kids chugged colorful liquid from glasses in front of them, while the Polly's stream suit displayed her in flattering situations. The accessory then began to play a pre recorded message while polling opened and closed her mouth mechanically much like a dubbed foreign movie or as observed in Dying Fish. I feel great joy and honor to find myself amidst the future of our country, the suit hollered as it streamed waving flags and marching troops. Never before have the coming times shone so brightly in shades of red and blue, just like your school aid. Poling rested her jaws for a moment, then continued to contort her mouth. I am happy to be with you today at... Here the recording stopped and Poling added, Rock Bottom Middle School. She paused, reread her note, and then whispered to the educator, Is this place below sea level? 
No, it's high up, the teacher replied. Any large boulders nearby? Again, nope. Poling nodded and continued. Out of this great confidence and pride, the government has decided to reduce public education from four to an easy two years. She ceased, and another message with a different voice was played. This message was brought to you by Diller. Have some Diller today. The teacher stepped in. If you get bored watching Mrs. Poling, the screens behind her, or the displays in your hands, stare at the cartoons on her suit, okay? Poling's outfit flashed colorful, fun animation. Senator Poling is here today to talk about God, guns, and family in that order. That's right, Poling said, grinning broadly. But first, I have an exciting announcement. An engineer holding a helmet stepped forward. The children gawked suspiciously at the contraption and its various protrusions. Can we have a volunteer? The teacher asked into the room. When no one rose, helpers snatched a kid and fitted the unwieldy apparatus. This took a while, as the helmet's inside was equipped with dozens of miniature mallets laid out all around the head. It's important that the hammers align with the stimulus centers exactly, remarked the engineer to a nodding polling. Upon activation, the stimulators went to work, thumping the child's skull in intricate patterns. Knockers on the noggin, remarked the teacher laughing. Shortly enough, all kids will wear these, added the friendly engineer. We call them hammerheads. Don't worry, though, he continued. This doesn't hurt the child directly. It merely stimulates desirable responses, even if the helmet is no longer worn. Fascinating, shrieked the teacher. With this great innovation, we can condition their precious minds to serve the country best. Suddenly, a fanfare blasted from Poling's suit. She had been out of the spotlight for too long. You know, I was, when I had greatly appreciated before I was even in that, a long time ago. But before then, we didn't have because, you know, if then, why not here? Ooh, Senator Poling speaks words salad, exclaimed the teacher a language loosely based on human communication, yet unintelligible to most, and even when studied, conveying no meaning. The hammerhead nodded enthusiastically. And now we'll have a round of Q&A, the teacher declared quickly. A student rose to address the senator. Isn't it crazy to elect a bunch of people hoping they'll do what they've promised for years to come, and if they don't, having little recourse to fire them before their lengthy terms are over? Why not democratize politics by disempowering political gatekeepers? The teacher interjected. That was a stupid question. Next. Another student rose. Doesn't our advanced voting technology make representatives obsolete? Who needs elected officials discussing issues when the vote can come straight from the people? Polling quickly cut in. Let me explain. People want leaders to inspire, cheer, propel, organize, and represent. Imagine all those expensive conferences, empty. She gestured empty. What would we do with the glorious spaces built for debate or the private chapters that get us there? Also, you wouldn't find a blinking tie like this on an AI. Poling proudly pointed at her accessory. But it represents the will of the people for better or worse, the kid replied before being fitted with a helmet. Poling's smile continued. What you want is an individual who filters what is even discussed and decides what's best for you. Another child popped up. What are your qualifications, Mrs. Pauling? Upon this, Pauling put on a serious face and stepped forward. I've studied the law. A gasp cut through the room. Well, not really, Pauling quickly added, but that's a line from the show. The teacher pointed to a different student. Melinda, you're next. A little girl rose. Mrs. Pauling, is it important to be honest? Okay, that's a hard one, Pauling put on her educator's face. Let me explain with a scenario. Her suit went into story mode, undulating in shades of red and purple. Imagine you go on a boat ride with your sweetheart. You're having a great day. Then you get home to your husband. He asks where you've been. You say, on a boat. The child sat back down. Did you have more than two years of education? Another girl asked. The teacher jumped in. Nobody needs more education. I only have one. Poling felt the need to interject. She rubbed her mustache while thinking deeply, then addressed the girl. Sweetie, if you want to waste your time knowing things, 
No one's going to marry you when you're 16. She smiled. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a snitch, a boy yelled. I want to backstab people, another shrieked. Children, you cannot all be snitches, although we do need a lot of those. But you can always spy on your fellow citizens for fun. I want to become an artist, a little girl said quietly. Hearing this, Poling turned serious. Dear, filling your mind with creativity will only make you wither faster in the turnip factories. The students were getting restless. If we behaved on the playground as politicians do in office, we'd get punished. How do you get away with your behavior? How are you above the rules that govern me? What's more important, money or fame? Isn't politics just showbiz for ugly people? They were interrupted by the door blowing open. A horde of revolutionaries stormed in, rattling pitchforks and rakes. One of them held a trident. They ran out of pitchforks, okay? Anfred was among them and came straight for polling. S. Sandra Poling, he addressed her sharply. Poling's hair rose like squirming snakes, and her jacket went into camo mode. You're not my driver. Anfred unrolled a decree. We, the people's movement for a better future on the day after tomorrow, have decided and decreed that all politicians, public negotiators, and legislators must join mandatory training to ensure their readiness for public duty. Pass a test? Outrageous! Poling's hair flashed red. An Untopia. <laughs> not for us, it burst out of Anfred. His allostatic stress was high that morning. 10. This looks tremendously familiar, Gould thought as he gazed across the barren landscape. The desert, the rock. He looked around, and there it was. The shiny giant, the village, the attackers. The godlike Goliath still stood as an inspiring sight. Nothing had changed since he last dreamed it. How great it would look in my lobby. Gould died to see the giant's face, and he propelled himself to catch up with it, while the being stomped toward an ocean of enemies. He floated along the monumental feet, up the abundant calves, then past the humongous trunk to the mighty belly. Just then, the behemoth stopped, raised a brawny arm, and blasted a stream of shimmering magma at the invaders. This was the most concentrated form of energy the universe had ever seen, Gould knew. Anyone touched by the flow glazed into a lustrous statue of forever. The fertile females flicked their tongues in a mysterious sing-song of victory and worship, and then decorated their city with the newly gained warrior ornaments. They brought not only triumphant memories, but unimaginable riches. Gould had finally gotten around the Leviathan, his vision sweeping up the heaving chest, to the head, to the face. It held no features. The shiny surface merely showed what was in front of it. Gould, it is I. The senator woke behind his megahogany desk. A young woman sat on his lap and his assistant, Spittle, sat opposite him. Both were staring at Gould, but neither of them revealed surprise or inconvenience upon his awakening. Spittle, for one, oozed ambivalence from his every pore. In the back of the room, an engineer fiddled with a computer, alternately cursing and blessing the device. Gould remembered now. He'd been resting his eyes. What a powerful, powerful dream. A vision, really, he mumbled. Yawning, he began to browse the teletiles. When a program met his fancy, Gould raised the volume, released a report detailing government corruption in Taxtetistan and how it penetrates every fiber of politics and society. Gould muted it. Wow, he shook his head. That's awesome. Inspiring, really, the young lady added. Gould turned to his assistant. Who's currently on top? Overreaching government and the like. Spacadonia, Spittle noted. We must beat them, you know. Make this the best government money can buy. Very well, sir. We should dismember the law altogether, mused Gould. Been saying that for years. Who needs laws when they have me? His gut heaved as he coughed up a laugh. What do we have on schedule today? Mysteros is here, sir, to present his invention of a crystal. At this, Gould lit up. Ah, yes, I remember. Bring him in. Spittle activated the door, and a hunched, robed man entered, clutching a shiny box with both hands. 
The elder placed the opaque container on Gould's desk, darkly staring into the crowd of attendants. Then, with a lightning-fast motion that woke even Spittle, the man lifted the top of the box, revealing a large, blood-red crystal inside. What is this? the girl asked, nervously skidding away from the stone. Mysteros made a hushing gesture, bowed, and spoke. This, Senator Gould, is the Captivator Crystal, Captivorus, my latest creation. It seizes is the soul of a slain enemy to marvel your victory for all eternity. Gould leaned forward and inspected the stone. Inside, a tiny nebula undulated in both shape and hue. He then tapped the thing with his fat finger. But can the soul see me? Absolutely, Mysteros replied proudly. He took the stone and held up his long, gnarly finger in front of it. The nebula undulated greatly. Mysteros went on and ran his sharp fingernail across the surface of the stone. A feeble shriek emitted from inside. Mysteros grinned. Your adversary will be trapped eternally for your viewing pleasure and to beautify your home. Gould grabbed the crystal and tossed it from hand to hand. He then shook it like a snow globe. The little nebula inside became very agitated. Gould stared at the stone impassively. Could a soul escape from this prison? he asked. No, master, have no fear. Only with a freshly deceased nearby, the stone smashed, and the soul inside readied to leap. Only then such a transfer could be made. Not bad, Gould said, and pocketed the thing. Send me a dozen. He waved Mysteros out with a dismissive hand gesture. Spittle, is Funkok here? Yes, sir. I will see him now. Spittle nodded and left the room. Gould picked up the TV remote once more and browsed the channels. This time he chose a fantasy program where wizards blasted their enemies with lightning. His eyes grew wide. Can you imagine? He said to the girl. So much power, it bursts from your hands. He grinned and touched the girl gingerly, as if not wanting to channel power. If only I had the leisure to hone my skills. She smiled warmly. Perhaps the GM will grant your wish. He might be listening. Upon hearing this, Gould straightened his pose. I'm sure he's always attentive, he then said loudly. I have nothing to hide. I am doing all his deeds. Now he lowered his voice once more. If anyone deserves to play president, it's me. He halted for a reaction. None came. Gould sighed. Great GM, are you God? He then whispered. The room turned eerily quiet. Gould quickly broke the silence. If you are, I want in, into heaven. He received no reply. I have money. He was interrupted when Spittle rushed in. Mr. Funkok has arrived, Senator Gould. Ah, Funkok. Gould beamed and turned to the young woman. This man will get you the dictatorship, um, directorship you've been wanting so impassionately. Funkok smirked. That can be arranged. He addressed Gould, not her. What does she bring to the table? She graduated from the finest schools. Great. Which ones? All of them, Gould replied rapidly, smiling. She's interested in something with a lot of exposure. I want to be on TV, the girl said, screeching. Sure, Funkok said, still looking at Gould. She could start as an intern, then perhaps over the years rise to Speaker of the House. Gould's smile vanished. She's hot, isn't she? He grinned at Funkok. Stand up and show yourself. Gould grabbed the girl's hand and led her up from his lap. Don't be shy, he said agreeably, as the girl spun a clumsy pirouette. There's no right answer, is there? Mr. Funkok said, laughing nervously. Gould didn't reply, but instead gawked at the girl's rump. Nose and ass are no good, though. The girl stared back, eyes wide open. Don't worry, we'll fix that for you, honey. You're getting too old to look ugly. Gould re-engaged his visitor. All right, thanks for your time, Funkok. I'll be in touch. Funkok rose. As the man turned, Gould suddenly shot up and thrust his hand forward. When nothing happened, great dismay overcame him. I was hoping for lightning. Me too, the girl said. I'll never do business with him again, Gould growled angrily. Did you see his dirty eyes devouring me? 
the girl asked with artificial consternation. Yeah, that's good, though, that's good, Gould replied. He inhaled. Remember, sweetie, you'll want as many people pretending to like you as possible. Suddenly, the engineer hailed from the rear. Sir, the setup is ready for a demonstration. Ah, great, Gould and the girl made their way over to him. What do you have for us? The engineer rose proudly and spread his arms across the control panel. This system enables you to form public opinion in seconds, not days or weeks. What do you want people to think? I want them to regard me as, as, his gaze sharpened and his voice quieted, their king. Gould glanced over his shoulder. No problem. The man began hacking the controls. Shouting arose outside and the lights flickered. Gould looked up. Is that the power or my sanity? The door blew open and a group of pitchforkists stormed in, Jan leading the pack. The engineer stared at them, then at his computer, then at Gould. Is that what the man meant by demonstration? The girl asked. Well, it's a beta version, the engineer said, hastily collecting his gear. Have a nice day, he rushed out. The pitchforkers let the coward pass, then sternly turned to Gould, waving their hay-moving tools imposingly. Gould took a step toward them. You know, I don't have any power, he said. I'm just an ugly actor, you know? The group disregarded his comments. Jan stepped forward. Senator Donner Gould, you will come with us. Your daughter stays. 11. Great waves of shouting rolled across the cattle facility the Politicons had been corralled into as members of dissenting caucuses engaged in yelling matches. The quarrels ended as quickly as they had started, with no one sure as to why or what had been argued over. This was not in vain, though. It served to train the polis neck musculature and vocal cords, as everyone expected to be back on duty in no time. Manny was bored out of his mind and resorted to Karnapitasana, watching cartoons on his builder blazer. Next to him, Poling fought strands of her hair that now drooped like a dead squid. Of them all, Gould was the only one happy. Using his overinflated biceps as a pillow, he was fast asleep. Poling picked up bits of conversation from two nearby colleagues. We need to proactively morph diverse human capital while negotiating front-end models. Upon this, her hair jumped to life and she exclaimed, Upon which I have discovered when holding but too fast. Poling beamed. When no reaction came, she added, I speak words alad too. Is bullshit not words alad there talking? A stranger informed her. Poling's excitement deflated. Manny, meanwhile, had given up viewing his suit. Have you guys ever watched Politicons? He asked into the round. No one had. It's not very good, he declared deactivating his suit. After perpetually pacing, sitting, crouching, and lying, not the verbal kind for once, boredom and impatience took an iron hold of him. Just zonk me with a buzz drone, he exclaimed. This woke Gould. You know, don't worry, the senator said in a lowered tone. The GM will come to our aid. Manny thought about this for a minute. But in case he doesn't, he whispered conspiratorially, we should plan for escape. Gould agreed. I will use my sexual magnetism to overcome female guards. Manny nodded. I shall reprogram my suit to strobe like a zone drone. My hair can enter any keyhole, unlock any door, Poling added. They agreed silently to put their abilities into action immediately. At a back door, Poling began to rub her head against the locking mechanism while Gould's massive body shielded her. Poling's hair, meanwhile, felt its way around and into the lock. After no time at all, a sudden click announced the barrier's unlocking. How adorable! An authoritative female voice blasted from the speakers all around. Are you plotting your own little resistance? The polis found themselves surrounded by guards. Without warning, Manny leaped aside and activated his suit, spreading his arms and legs like a flying fox. Ha! His suit sputtered. Gould suddenly jumped forward, thrusting his armpits at the oppressors. Obey! Neither action produced the desired result, and all three were dragged away by the P.E. 
For what felt like an eternity, the Politicons were led through a maze of hallways, past and through countless chutes and bunts. Gould repeatedly thrust his fist toward the guards, but lightning wouldn't come. One of the guards kept peeping at polling. Aren't you the gal from the show? I breed a lot and I can't stop? The giddy man finally asked. I'm your biggest fan. No, an exhausted polling replied. We're the Politicons. Right, right, another male guard now said. I thought it was you guys. The guard thrust his loins at Manny. Did you know, Gould was ready to exploit the moment, that Donner means thunder in German? No! The guards shook their heads incredulously. But that is so interesting! Gould nodded knowingly. He pulled up his muscle pants and drifted into an official tone. You know you can show your superiors, he gestured with hyphens, that you're in charge. He nodded in his own agreement. Tell them that you're voting Gould, and there's nothing they can do. I don't know about that, the guard replied sheepishly, but I had this great idea for a show right along the lines of that. It's called I'm Farting Up the Elevator and You Can't Stop Me. The show's about people in an alep, Gould interrupted. That's a great concept, he warmly said. I'll talk to my producer as soon as you let us go. Just then, they reached the aperture of a dark room. The black space held nothing except for a concrete table and stools, which were lighted by spotlights. The opposite wall sank into darkness and barely revealed a large mirror and multiple unlit humanoid shapes in front of it. Cameras from all angles recorded every move. What will you do to us? Poling grew anxious. I, I have something to confess. Before she could finish, Gould cut in. I'll bet they'll use mind-altering substances to extract information from us, he assumed with a shrug. Manny became all ears, mind-altering. Perhaps this rebellion isn't all bad. Suddenly, a forceful female voice thundered from the darkness. For generations, your kind has suppressed the very people they were supposed to serve. The shape of a person rose in the dark. But your reign of terror has come to an end. Says who? A guard asked. One of the shadowy outlines stepped forward and into the light. It was Jan. When Manny saw her, he skipped. Your prices, girl. Did they get you too? Watch out for yourself. People say there's a dystopia out there. The one you made, Jan said, shrieking. Outrageous, replied the confused Manny. I've never created anything. I b believe her. Him? A new voice from the rear said. Manny shook his head in disbelief. You're one of them? Why are you doing this to us? Jan swept back her hair in a rolling wave. To aid the poor, the exploited, and the disenfranchised. She examined herself in the mirror, making sure she looked both threatening and cute. And I've always wanted my own uprising. No one dared speak. Suddenly, Anfred knew that he was afraid of and in love with Jan. Enough about me. You, she continued, pointing at the Politicons, should be ashamed for lying about everything to everyone. But why? Manny was genuinely confused. It's all I know. Poling, who had an expression of recognition on her face, suddenly shouted, Your voice, you're the caller. Indeed, it was I, Jan asserted herself victoriously. Wait until your old man hears of this, Manny screamed. The guards held him back. You don't threaten me, Jan said, stepping forward for the struggling Manny. The line sounded great. She had practiced its delivery earlier. With so much theatrical talent, Manny observed, you should be joining politics. I'm not interested in your nonsense. I'm making my own, Jan said, and then sat down. She signaled Anfred to fetch snacks. Care, care for a turnip? He held out a bowl to the polis. No, thank you, Pauling said. My teeth are for decoration only. K kohlrabi tea they are. Cool rabi, Gould blurted. I want that. He took one of the whitish yellow vegetables and tasted it. Instantly, his face contorted. It's sour and bitter all at once. Jan slammed the table, her face serious. Who's running the show? She shrieked. It seemed as if the room shrank around her. Us. I, not us. The polis were thrown into disarray. Who is the one you call GM? Asked Jan. No one replied. Don't you want to tell? She didn't seem surprised. Let me show you this. A guard dragged in a zone drone and floated it in front of the Politicons. 
They eyed the device uncomfortably. Activate it, Jan commanded. The guards equipped themselves with welding masks and flicked a switch. Brutal audio and video were blasted from the device. The unmasked attendant's eyes bulged, and veins appeared on their foreheads, except Anfred's. Although it was impossible to resolve what was happening between the blocks of aggressively alternating colors on the drone's screen, now and then, a vision of Gould, Poling, and Manny flashed. That's your show, that's Politicons, as most of the population sees it. It doesn't show my beautiful hair, Poling exclaimed with panic in her eyes. My subtle performance is all in vain, Manny shouted while rubbing his crotch. Tell me who's in charge, Jan asked again, more forcefully this time. The polis stayed silent. Upon this, guards slammed copies of Gould and Manny's books on the table. Look inside, Jan said with a devilish smile. Gould gingerly opened a copy of Words of a Bigger Eternity, his book, and gasped. His inspired prose had been exchanged for nudie pics, with no text remaining at all. But then his face relaxed. You know, this is much improved over mine. Now, will you tell me who's in charge so we can punish those who did this to your work? It's us. Nonsense! Jan slammed her fist on the table and spun Gould in his chair. You guys couldn't run a country. You can't even run to the buffet. All of the polis shrugged. This left Jan perplexed. You must know who you're working for. Who calls the shots? The polis remained silent. Gould's face turned defiant. You know, how about yourself? How does a girl of, mm, 24 organize a nationwide uprising all by herself? He looked at the dim guards. Who's the true mind of the rebellion? This upset Jan like nothing before. I didn't have any, much help, she shouted. W well, there's B. Bronk, Anfred suggested. He then added more quietly, uh, and me. Bronk is just stupid muscle. Nobody needs him. Uh, and the m mysterious benefactor? Aha, so you're doing someone else's bidding. Gould leaned back into his concrete chair, his face painted with a smug expression of victory. Why fight the natural order of things, he continued. The strong, he propped up his drooping biceps, rule over the weak. At this, Anfred shot up. Y you're not so t tough. He gathered all of his strength to raise a spaghetti arm. Gould rose as well, and his muscles deflated with a quiet fart. Gents, please, Jan said with satisfaction. There will be enough opportunity for conflict. The two weaklings sat back down. Why don't you ask your mysterious benefactor all these questions? Manny suggested, rising as if ready to leave. W we don't know how to contact to him. He speaks to us through electronics only. At this, the polis smiled uncomfortably. Jan shot Anfred a glance. The room drowned in silence. No food pellets for these three tonight. Jan once again brought her fist down. Take them to the hole. A guard stepped forward. Ma'am, sir, their quarters are beneath the hole. Do you wish to upgrade them? No, damn you all. Jan was furious, though not enough to upset her hair. She gestured to remove the polis. When all had quieted, she whispered to Anfred, Are they clueless? She contemplated this. They're just performers, clowns, entertainers. Ha, who would have thought? Nen, not me, replied Anfred. He stared at Jan, and a tickle rose from his belly. His head spun. Jan clenched her fists. We must find this GM. Anfred nodded. Right, but then added, What does that e even stand for? 12. The following day, a nearby kindergarten saw an unusually small-minded crowd. Since adult education centers had been converted to video stores or brothels decades ago, the uprising held few options for their ambitious plans to educate their pollies, and thus settled on childcare facilities as the freshly reduced public education offered many vacancies. While poly students as colorful and dirty as Play-Doh spread their too often too massive bodies into the minuscule chairs, Rebel leadership mingled with white-clad educators in an adjacent control room overseeing the classes. Anfred wore a spotless white lab coat, while Jan was adorned with an enormous sash embroidered with the golden letters, President. She busied herself positioning the accessory while Anfred stared idly. He wanted to brush her hair. Jan turned her sash to the left slightly, then back right, 
and then back left again ever so slightly, then to the right once more. Ahem! Coughs emerged from the group. Jan looked up. Dear all, she said, conjuring a smile. Now that Thimerica's propaganda machine is disabled, she noticed a smudge near the P of her sash, but continued, Government, operations disrupted. Jan began scraping the mark with her fingernail. We must quickly step in and rebuild the country. The dang stuff wouldn't come off. Her rubbing grew more assertive, but now the stupid surface began to scratch. Anfred couldn't bear her struggle. Ye, you look very p, p pretty, he remarked timidly. I know, Jan shrieked, giving up on the stain. Anyway, how can we form a capable government? Anfred? Well, we're assessing the educational approach, Anfred said while checking stats on a clipboard. Citizens F from the mm, mid levels, the low, low, lower levels, A and the upper tiers have been sampled for ability. Just then, Jan's communicator sounded. She bounced aside and answered. Immediately, her face lit up. Hi, yeah, we're doing a meeting and stuff. She pointed the device around, showcasing the scene. That guy? She asked into the communicator. Yeah, that's my ugly pet. She snorted. Watch Hentrakantamom tonight? Sure, XOXO. She hung up and turned to Anfred. Right, ability. How about our rebel volunteers? Will they be able to help run the country? Unfortunately, they have forgotten that they had volunteered. Jan pondered. Can we utilize the proles? She finally asked. After all, there are five billion of them, durable and easily bred. In answer, Anfred gestured the group toward the side of the room. Here, behind a window and a, a razor wire covered barricade, a fully armored educator tended to a partly restrained prole sitting at an easel. The tutor lifted his chain link protected hand and presented a crayon to the creature. Initially freezing at the sight of an unknown item, the manimal then went on to cautiously lick the stick. When the educator warmly gestured toward the artboard, the prole suddenly shot back to life grabbed the crayon, and thrust it into his eye socket until it vanished. Oh my, shouted Jan. How did it do that? Did Dunno, but that what was his the third. The attendees shook their heads. If only the voice were here to guide us, Jan finally said. Anfred nodded. I th thought our patron would reveal him, self after our spectacular suck cess. Yeah, perhaps she knows that we're well in charge and don't require her anymore, Jan said re-engaging the stain on her brooch now. Her? Anfred asked. The thought hadn't occurred to him. The individual is most certainly a woman, Jan said without looking up from her presidential cleaning task. Ho, oh, however it m m may be, it appears that we may be stuck with our politicons. You must be joking, the answer shot from Jan very fast as this was a line she had memorized this morning. Anfred cut in. Uh, afraid not, though at t attempts to determine their s skills and schooling have failed, he said with a grim expression. Tests were in, validated by cheating A and incomprehension. I cannot imagine the situation being so dire, exclaimed Jan with a wonderfully worried face. No, Anfred continued. Oh, Ob, serve this, he said, flipping a switch, transparencing a wall. Behind it lay a classroom with a pool of polis. Among them, polling could be seen staring off near a pile of alphabet bricks. She had formed, not underestimate, out of the blocks. Nearby, Manny held a pony-shaped mirror, nervously grooming himself with a tiny pink comb. It's so cute how they're sitting on those little chairs, said Jan, gesturing tiny with her hands. W well, watch this. Anfred spoke into a microphone. Specimen A53. A Polly jumped up. What's the first L legislation you'd introduce once elected? Wife's expenses paid by the government, the legislator yelled. Deep wrinkles disturbed Anfred's forehead. He glanced at his colleagues. Did, do you see? When no one saw, he continued. L, let us observe an ed educational session to gain a deeper understanding of their psyche and needs. Just then, the classroom's door flew open, and security guards led Gould in. His vishuig hung low, his muscles drooped while he argued with the agents. Does my office send you the bribe, or do I stuff you myself? 
he spotted polling. You're here too? She shrugged. Gould lowered his voice. You know people say there's a dystopia out there. An educator shushed the commotion, and when all the polis had assembled into a circle, she began, Hello, everybody. Welcome to our session where we will educate and inspire each other. She clapped her hands, so excited was she. We're here to make you better politicians and better selves. Gould jumped up. I don't need knowledge to be intelligent. Not surprised by this reaction, the tutor nodded calmingly. After your graduation, you'll be released back into your natural habitats. Her eyes passed over the excited Polly faces all around the circle. Let's begin. She threw a bar of chocolate on a table, right into the middle of the group. Everybody shot in to grab it at once, resulting in a tug of war, screaming and tears. The teacher let the events play out for a while, then broke up the commotion. See, that couldn't work. Try sharing. The polis sized each other up and slowly, hesitantly, released their grip on the treat. The instructor smiled, took the chocolate, broke it into equal pieces, and spread it among the polis. Gould was intrigued. Now that's a new angle. I thought the strongest would get it, said Manny, rubbing his hair. Or the fastest, Poling exclaimed. The teacher quieted the class. We will now play fun games designed to prepare you for running our government. We have pork picker, the soaring deficit balloon, and design your own law degree. You know, bring on the pork, said Gould hungrily. The balloon lifts us away, Manny exclaimed. Make your own degree, Poling asked. Done that, she added quietly. Again, there was great tumult. When no consensus could be reached, the teacher sighed. All right, let's move to story time. Now everybody gathered around the friendly educator, quieting in anticipation, their eyes growing big. The teacher began. Once upon a time, there was a great force. She gazed into the round of excited faces. The Lord, a Fempoli shouted. No said the instructor, shaking her head with emphasized strokes. The fossil fuel industry, a powerful branch of the government that caused the great atmospheric shock of 2054 and the inhabitability of the Southern Hemisphere. How was it fixed? With prayer? Asked an iron lady, biting her lip. No, and here the educator laughed, utilizing a power unknown to many of you, science. A murmur rose. The teacher squelched the confusion. Today, I will teach you all about this science. Back in the control room, Anfred opaqued the wall. Jan applied her glasses, but then immediately removed them to rub her eyes in beautiful distress. There's no hope, she said, and the group was left with their heads shaking. Maybe there is, Anfred said. Our politicons lust for power, are obsessed with self-importance, and are motivated by greed. They only care about the craft of deceit and the clever schemes to get, gain, and win votes. The cunning methods of distraction, distortion, denial, and blame shifting. Our politicons will say and do whatever it takes to keep and add to their power. They are motivated by self-preservation and personal gain, and they put their own interests above all else. Politicons will act in any way they feel benefits themselves, regardless of whether it is in the best interest of their constituents or country. Anfred gasped for air, surprising even himself with his long, stutter-free speech. The room's ether had suddenly thickened with attentiveness. Even Jan had stopped tinkering with her sash. Anfred's head spun from the attention he received, but he continued. We're looking for persons of integrity and high moral character who possess a strong desire to serve others, recognize their imperfections, and strive to overcome them to be the best person they can be. They must know the moral code of right and wrong, the positive attributes of honesty, humility, and patriotism. They must accept responsibility, and they must put country before self. He took a bite of turnip and continued. Statesmen explore issues carefully and seek to vote in the best interest of the nation, even if this means losing votes. True statesmen cherish freedom and liberty, have a deep affection and concern for those they serve, and feel a profound sense of duty and loyalty to their country. Anfred's eyes passed between the attendants. They all nodded approvingly. Dear fellow resistors, we must change our approach from voting for office to choosing our representatives. 
He paused, gazing deeply at and beyond the wall. Jan had trouble making a beautiful face after this long and boring speech. That may be so, she said, but what does it all mean? The Confucian examination system for selecting officials. Anfred stopped. How did he know about this? I'm afraid these are not skills learned in a classroom. Only hands-on, life-changing experience can produce such character and knowledge. Anfred smiled, as if he had been waiting for this question to state his final groundbreaking epiphany. We don't need elections. We need selections. The room broke into a murmur. Anfred continued, and in a real-world scenario, not some academic enclosure. Jan nodded boldly while clapping forcefully. We could design a competition, Anfred said, where wits, endurance, creativity, and leadership are all equally important. The group contemplated this. How do we ensure that the politicons don't cheat their way out of it? We isolate them, replied a resolute Anfred with surprising vigor. Isn't that cruel? Dunno, Anfred said with his impairment returning and a sudden air of weakness. Cruelty is all I've ever known. 13. That night in the poly barn, Gould and Manny went to sleep early, but Poling's mind raced. She rolled around, musing on recent events and the characters that filled the corral. She realized that she had never bothered to contemplate her colleagues, never thought about their beliefs or her own. She played her part, made the show as interesting as possible, and that was it. If she never worked as a politicon again, perhaps she could publish parliamentary almanacs. She began to categorize her peers. There were the corrupt and skewed rulers of refute, the dissemblers, cheaters, and deceivers. Plucky trolls, corpulous and slow, but with an enormous capacity to swallow insults. Lanky administrators, irritating, insipid, tedious. Inbred iron virgins, ITVs, full-bodied, pious, shielded by three layers of status quo. There were slick smooths, spit slithers, and urcocrats. Poling knew that despite their physical differences, these societal leeches were the same at heart. When she joined, fresh from the Stanislavski School of Politics, only a few characters existed. Now there were so many. She had experimented with varying roles, ending up with the slicked hick, and she knew that none of her colleagues could match her performance. After all, she had duped them all into thinking she had risen from the upper levels and that she was one of them. I may be the only one who ever made it up the city, Poling reflected. Made up, ha, just like my backstory. Growing up on the mid-levels, Poling often gazed at the sky and its glittering ships, dreaming of cruising inside one. She remembered peace enforcement showing up at her tailgate a few years ago. After a less than spotless past, she fully expected an arrest but was instead delivered a letter of admission to the coveted Stanislavski Political School. She had lived by herself at the time, subsisting in a car, knowing well that the admission letter alone wouldn't even get her through the doors of the esteemed university, certainly not the way she was dressed. Yet, the following day, a builder blazer and a visuwig were delivered, and from then on, polling just went with it. When she showed up on the semester's opening day, all documents had been submitted in her name, with her pictures and her signature. It had been a long run since then. Was the lucky streak over? Getting trapped in this uprising wouldn't have happened on the mid-levels, Poling reflected. Naturally, she'd be fried like that guy Anfred by now. But what was her purpose in all of this? Nobody had ever demanded anything of her in return for all the favors. Despite the training, she knew nothing of politics and shared none of her colleagues' passion for the law. The law, rules that other people had made up, their opinions on conduct. Unlike the laws of nature, there was no mysterious underlying system of genius, just someone making stuff up or interpreting what others had previously fabricated. Where did Gould and Manny fit in? She knew Manny had inherited his part, a typical entitlement poly. Not only had the man no ethics, but he completely lacked interest in his fellows. A man as phony as his medals, a man who boasts of never speaking the truth. How can that be true, she thought, snickering. Then there was Gould, the classic corrupt and corpulent self-dealing politician, a backstabbing, colleague-stomping jerk, archetypical blowhard. He had played his role for so long that he believed it himself. 
While he pretended to only want the best of everything, Donner Gould consumed food worse than his inferiors when no one was looking, yet the finest had to be accessible at all times. There were so many more. What would these people do without politicons? Poling wondered. The iron wenches were conceivable as rural motel owners who made the dilapidated facilities their personal prisons, where they could terrorize employees and guests alike. Perhaps lady-run vehicle dealerships were up their alley, or small shops selling religious trinkets. The bureaucrats? They would naturally strive in any office environment, constantly obsessing over rules and regulations, driving colleagues, superiors, and clients equally insane. The crazed screamers? Salesmen? Cars, RVs, insurance? It didn't matter. Get the best deals, get the lowest prices, get screwed. The well-meaning dopes? Something non-commercial. Clerks at non-profits, their good intentions eradicated by sluggishness and incompetence. Polling could think of many more. While these were highly varying characters, they had one thing in common. They would drag down any organization with them. The country they were supposedly running only survived because they weren't actually in charge. Something else was controlling it, directing the polis and citizens alike. An invisible, latent force. She thought about the GM. Who was it? How was this information lost? Through countless years, Poling had trained herself into believing in the existence and superiority of the being known as the Great Master. The voice and mysterious acts of this superior unit, as well as its unaging existence, only fortified her belief. Now and then, mysterious documents would appear, both proving and disproving the GM's story. One troubling time, Poling remembered, evidence emerged of the GM's growth through the decades. There was irrefutable evidence that the person claiming to be the GM wasn't a person at all. She'd never given any weight to these allegations. The voice that was the GM never acknowledged them. And besides, what difference did it make to her? It was much smarter to follow the system's rules and do well within them than to question or fight them. If the GM suddenly turned out to be a fraud or non-existent, everyone in the world would have to start all over again. Hierarchies would have to be rebuilt and power structures reestablished. A major headache and potentially dangerous instability, no doubt. Or perhaps everything was self-regulating and had been set up to run automatically in the distant past. If that was the case, such knowledge was long lost. If you're doing well within a system, why destroy it? Whoever the controlling overlord was, they would surely not allow such infliction. Polling dozed off. A commotion woke polling. The day had risen and so had a cloud of polis, encircling Jan and Anfred by the entrance. Tension hung low and heavy, and the guards tightened on the riot foam spigots as Anfred began to address the crowd. Some of you may have wondered, the rookie rebel announced, what this incarceration was all ab uh, ab ab about, Jan filled in. She continued, from now on, Thamerica and its allies will enact novel ways of selecting and training government officials. You shall be educated in the ways of democracy and civilization entirely among your own kind. Teamwork, Kukukur. Jan let Anfred struggle. Courage, she said. Prepare severance. And good government will lead to your success and release. This will be your only way to return. Return! Shouts arose. From where? The initial round of your experience is called the errands, Jan explained, noticing a stranger looking favorably at her blouse. I thought we agreed to call it the grunt hunt. I see your creativity is returning nicely, Jan remarked dismissively, but we should stick to something more technical. A suit jumped up. This will not happen. The GM will never allow it. Jan disregarded the outburst and continued. It is a necessary preparation for the subsequent island experience. Hearing this, Gould's face brightened. Island? Experience? That sounded great. He wasn't sure how to read the smirk on Anfred's face. You know, is the island a reward? Gould asked. Ha, you could put it that way, Anfred exclaimed without a stutter. Years of cabbage had shriveled his supramarginal gyrus for controlling malignant urges. When will all this madness begin? A riled Manny yelled. It was then that strong hands grabbed his left and right. Now. 14.
An ocean of faces greeted Poling as she woke. A thousand ghouls grinned at her with the dirtiest, vilest expression of joy she'd ever seen. This was a smile as fake as their school system, a travesty of joy, a sinful expression. She rummaged through the piles of scattered pamphlets depicting the senator from decades ago, praising his role as a public servant, the brightest mind, the most able body, etc. The naivete of the flyers made her laugh. This type of campaigning had long been abandoned. Oh, the olden days, but was it right to brainwash people like this? Polling, comparatively new to the system, understood what she was in for, just like Gould did. Administrative jobs didn't pay enough, and no one worked in science or engineering anymore. And, at any rate, she was too stupid to do any of that nerdy stuff. There was simply no other way to earn her shoes and handbags. Coming to think of it, Poling wasn't sure how or where these were produced. Some foreign country, she assumed. Would she be able to return to the show after this? What to do if Politicons was canceled? What other programs could she work for? Outdoing Hentria Contamom was an option. She had two children already. How many more did she need? Penta? Octa? Hecta? That'd be a lot of breeding. And she'd have to find a husband first, being divorced and all that. She thought of Manny. He was obviously flirting with her. Why not just take the easy route and marry him? Getting rid of his current wife should be easy. She and Manny had so much in common, like their lack of humor. His hair was too crazy, though, but she would make him slick it back the way it ought to be. But appearances weren't all that important. She was sometimes too superficial. What about his income? But enough of this for now. These questions would have to be answered later. Her drugged mind cleared, and she found herself sitting in what must have been a classroom. Everything in the space was covered with a finger-thick layer of dust and chalk, so ancient that it had solidified. Before her ran the trail of an ancient cleaning sponge. Wetted by toxic sludge, it had found life, dragged itself across the table, only to die and freeze into place five feet from where it had started. Merely dull hints of gloomy light entered from outside, and Poling realized that she was down on the surface level. How did I get here? She browsed her pockets for a communicator. It was gone. Oh, right. Those revolutionaries are making the world a better place, as if that hadn't been worked out already. She gazed out the window and down the canyon of buildings, trying to gauge the time of day. Impossible. Her glance fell onto the brightly illuminated chopter at the end of the trash-filled boulevard, merely a mile away. Right, the way out to the island. The murky air, the howling winds, and the never-ending rain of garbage made polling pensive. Was this punishment merited? What was expected of her here? How could she get past the hazards to the chopter? Poling dozed off, as she always did when she started thinking. A nearby rustle startled Poling out of her nap. Moving along the wall, it suddenly seized up and worked into a shuffle, rising and ebbing as if something struggled. Poling wanted to flee, but when she rose, she perceived a whimper. Something needed help. She parted heaps of rubbish, hot on the heels of the noises, and there it was, a little girl, dirty, caught in rings of plastic, unable to escape. Prole spawn. The sleeve holding the kid came from fastening barrels of sludge and was commonly tossed. Poling never knew these ties presented such dangers to the manimals. She watched the mindless girl's futile attempts with some amusement. How inept that kid was, flopping around and not understanding the simple way to free herself. But then Poling noticed the skeletons scattered around the room, all entangled in similar traps, and felt sad. She would help the girl. Moving slowly, the Polly began to untangle the mess. Poling attempted a smile, trying to appear as unthreatening as possible. Alas, layers of makeup, bronzing cream, and other nonsense covered her so thickly that expressions rarely escaped her face. The child lay frozen and staring at her, clearly playing dead. Just when Poling thought her kindness had calmed the kid, the spawn's eyes flew open and she screeched from the top of her lungs. Teacher! Poling stumbled back. Hi, little one. I'm not a teacher. Could you point me to the nearest communicator so that I can hail a limousine? Hasty scratching echoed from the walls, the ceiling, and even from beneath the floor around Poling. Countless rag monsters appeared from holes and crevices around her, hissing viciously. Never mind, I'll find one myself, she said, making a move toward the door. 
Polling accelerated into strides as the kids growled at her every step. Suddenly, a bigger boy appeared in the doorway, blocking the way out. What? Here? Hi, bigger little one. Would you like an autograph? The youth didn't react. I helped your sister escape the terrors of rubbish. Here, I'll show you how to do it yourself next time. She grabbed the wrapper and slung it around the boy. The youth immediately entangled himself, then rolled and convulsed about the floor. Learning, he screamed. Yes, you'll be learning this, Poling replied. The boy's eyes had become marbles of terror and his mouth a horror cave. Within seconds, his struggle was over and he seized up. Suddenly, all the children vanished and it quieted again, leaving a leftover Poling wondering what had just happened. She shrugged and made her way outside, quite happy with herself. That's when she bumped into the prole hunters. They had formed an impenetrable circle, watching incredulously as Poling stepped over the dead boy. Poling was quickly bound and bundled. This was a skill the proles still possessed, as Poling noticed with interest and frustration. She smiled at the reversal of fortunes. Perhaps someone would teach her how to untangle. As they hauled her off, Poling studied the prole ahead of her. He was the biggest and the strongest, and in a society where physicality mattered above all else, he must have been the leader. She didn't find the man entirely unattractive. Bulging muscles and crotch, tattoos galore. These were all things Poling admired. Not so much the sharp teeth and grime, pointy fingers and toes, or the mismatched, incestuous eyes. She wondered if he attended church or at least prayed to her God. Did Jesus have tats? Barbed wire infinity would have looked so hot with his crown of thorns, she thought. Poling noticed the same tattoos on multiple proles and remembered that they were now genetically passed between generations. They finally reached a settlement of hovels made from fermented trash. Right after unloading the politician into a burrow, the proles began to quarrel. Poling used the time to contemplate the creatures more closely. They were brutal idiots, imbeciles, dangerous and violent morons, witless monsters who'd snap your neck because they liked the sound. Who would have thought that the evolution in which she didn't believe could be reverted this way? Why was the Lord allowing this? Poling didn't know and inexplicably felt sorry, at least until elderly prole wenches began smacking and tugging at her skin in an effort to tear it and ferment her. She understood that the end had come. A whistle grew. It increased in intensity. She closed her eyes, awaiting the inevitable. This is what approaching death must sound like, she thought, or perhaps approaching Jesus. Did the Savior come on a sled? Then loud noises, screaming and yelling encircled her. Was this the transition to the afterlife? Poling had always imagined it as a floaty shift with lights, clouds, and such. She dared to open her eyes. Instead of the grim reaper, a malfunctioning zone drone had crashed into the hovel. The device had somehow survived the impact, but with its delicate rotors disabled, would not rise again. The proles clubbed the machine frantically, but the smart automaton flashed defensive shows, and soon all the proles were glued to the contraption's screens. What a marvelous coincidence. Surely a higher power had aided her. Perhaps the Lord? She'd played her part of the pious conservative in Politicons long enough to believe it. Poling dared a quick glance at the sputtering media machine. She had not often seen her show, or any TV programming, preferring to be in it, not in front of it. Politicons, as the lowest levels of society received it, was transmitted as aggressively undulating bursts of noise, screeching blasts, eruptions of pixels, unwatchable gibberish designed to stun the senses, and nothing else. Periodic breaks gave a glimpse of a poly or a hint of laughter. There was no way for a human to make sense of, let alone enjoy, the program. It was a computer-modeled, addictive sequence of colors that hurled any person into a stupor, melting minds and flooding senses. As she snuck out, her eyes fell upon the children, now riveted to the machine just like their elders. She knew they'd be glued to the box until it ran out of power, perhaps days later, and they'd be starving. Poling watched this with sudden sadness. Was this wrong? She didn't care enough and left for the chopter. 15. Manny lay silently buried in seas of rubbish. His surroundings were dark and damp and smelled of rotting cabbage, but he perceived none of it. His gaze was fixed on the prize in front of him, 
a 20-pound hyper rat gleefully grazing on meat algae. Manny rubbed his bush of crazed hair. Mice had set up home in it. It was the softest they had ever had, but not the cleanest. He grabbed one and crunched it for the energy burst, tensed his muscles, and then jumped at the mega rodent ahead. He bound and ran on all fours, his strength and agility astounding even himself. How far he'd come. The poly finally leaped onto his prey, his body stretching to its limit as never before. Sinking his fangs deep, Manny broke the beast's neck. With the trophy safely in his maw, pride overcame the hunter. He raised himself tall, ruling over the seas of trash he felt he now ruled. Then he remembered his stomach, and the politicon licked his chops in anticipation of the meal. Out of nowhere, a prole pack emerged, their eyes keenly fixed on Manny's prize. Yet the poly didn't panic as the brutes approached, even when the tallest and strongest among them stepped forward, gesturing at the catch. After seconds of locked eyes in a tense standoff, Manny hadn't flinched. Suddenly, the prole thrust up his arm and burst into a bellowing cheer. The group howled in victory, and so did Manny. He had made his first catch, proven himself worthy, and passed initiation. Manny was one of them now. The pack raced home with the poly among them, freely floating through seas of trash. They arrived at the prole pods to a roar, where prole spawn and hideous femproles cheered the triumphant huntsman. A female came for Manny, hugged and kissed the poly, her soft black teeth nudging as their mouths met. Feasting that night, Manny reflected on the brutes among which he now lived. They were playful monsters, their imbecile goofs obscuring the brutality of their lives. These things would hunt and toy him to death like a cat would a mouse. Without conscious perception or reflection, these creatures wouldn't understand that they'd wronged. A prole spawn crawled onto Manny, affectionately offering a rat's chop. It was his son, one of four, and he fondly hit the boy on the head. How do I have children? How long has it been? His mind was hazy, and time had blurred. Just when he resolved to clear up, the dessert made its way around, and Manny took a deep drag from the modified low-flow tailpipe. The fumes of shredded plastic made sure that all his crucial thoughts melted away, flowing into a stream of primordial ooze. The revolting odors of hive and food, his disgusting wife, and the dumb growls of his spawn dissolved. He felt his brain and stomach churn, rioting against the toxins. After another generous serving, he dropped into a grotesque pose and dozed off. Manny didn't know how long he'd been out, but with the piercing fumes of rubber still filling the air, it couldn't have been long. He was sitting cross-legged with his head lolling back, feeling a weight in his lap. When he looked down, he found a twisted piece of garbage, the Prole King's scepter. Everybody was still out, leaving Manny confused as to how it got there. He rose to return the treasured item to its rightful owner when he accidentally kicked the queen. Manny smiled warmly and indicated not to rouse his majesty. The woman first stared at him, then at the scepter, and then howled from the top of her lungs. The tribe popped awake instantly, gawking at Manny and the pipe in disbelief. His mispronounced grunts didn't help communicate his innocence. The prole fighters banged their chests. They couldn't fathom Manny's betrayal. His highness himself was staring witlessly at their beloved upworlder. But their mixed emotions would soon flip into the one state they always fell back to. Rage. Manny glanced at his pregnant wife and spawned one last time, then left the hive unchallenged. Where would he go? This world was all he knew, or was it? His brain was still fried, but there was something else floating around in his head. A chopter, whatever that was, waited for him somewhere. But how to find it? He cut the thought short when a dozen howling proles materialized behind him. They'd already forgotten he'd been among them once, and Manny knew that the hunt was on. He sighed and dove into the refuse. Like dolphins, the proles dipped in and out of the garbage, moving faster than the poly ever could. But the cunning tactician had regained his wits and set up a decoy that the fools were now having. But where was he heading? He had a vague recollection of a challenge, an uprising. How long had he been living among the wild? Would the aircraft still be there? He'd traveled for nearly an hour when he finally caught sight of the vehicle, parked behind infrastructure safety walls. Manny, 
or rather the huge statue he had unveiled at the factory, stood right in front of the wall and blocked its only entrance. Someone had carefully placed it here to obstruct his way. When Manny saw the ropes fastened to its arms, chest, and neck, leading to a winch, he understood. The prole's howls grew louder. They were gaining. Manny knew they'd never give up. He himself had taught them their ways. The poly tried to squeeze through his giant replicated legs, but his bold physique, both real and stone, wouldn't allow it. Anger and frustration rose in him, but he made it to the winch and turned the handle. Sobbing, he cranked. Notch after notch, tear after tear, the ropes tightened. Before long, the stone giant creaked and finally, with a dry smack, lifted off its base. It leaned toward the laboring man, ever so slowly reaching its tipping point. Manny hesitated for an instant, the thought of sacrificing himself for the sake of his immortal likeness passing his mind. But the sound of proles clanking chains convinced him to see the task through. Only seconds later, the giant monstrosity fell and smashed into a thousand pieces. Manny wasted no time stepping across his colossal stone crotch. Behind it, the door was ajar. After he'd passed the opening, the entryway shut itself. A breeze? The chopter's engines were running, and it should have pushed the door in the opposite direction. He shrugged it off and walked toward the machine. When he saw the chopter lift off, he was gripped by an iron fright. He heard the prole's wild screams behind him, and when he turned, Manny realized that one had managed to scale the wall using the ropes, an incredible intellectual feat for the creature. Manny gave him a warm smile, then killed him with a rock. The chopter, meanwhile, was nearly 30 feet off the ground, beyond the reach of any man. But Manny wasn't a man anymore and would leap as he'd never leaped before. He grabbed the machine's skids and pulled himself up. He did it. Eternal bliss on a tropical island would be his. Then the door slid open, and a jovial gould greeted him. He sat with polling, joking and snacking. Manny looked over the traders suspiciously. You were gonna take off without me? You know, of course, replied a cheerful Gould. Just then, a haze streamed from nozzles around the cabin, and the polis went blank. 16. The sensation of his face scraping over a bolt woke Gould. Unending vibrations inside the military chopter had pushed his narcotized body across the floor. Drugged. Again. He was too weak to rise, and while the poly oriented himself, he felt his brain scrub at his skull, his bones at his muscles, and his eyeballs at their sockets. The roar was chaotic and overpowering. They ought to use this for the show's soundtrack, he thought. Gould was confined to a tiny section of the flying machine's cabin, with a window, door, and video screen closely in front of him. He noticed that he wore a backpack, strapped on tight. The screen was off resisting all attempts to activate it. He stared outside. Where was the machine headed? The chopter was traversing an ocean at a considerable altitude, approaching an island. Pleasure Island. That was the name, right? Other aircraft hovered ahead, some nearly over the extensive isle featuring forests, meadows, rivers, beaches, and even a volcano. A perfect vacation, Gould thought. Suddenly, the door on a nearby aircraft opened, and spewed a dark shape. Gould strained to see what was falling out when a chute opened, and he recognized a person drifting over the island and landing on a beach. His eyes veered back to the sky, where they found another aircraft close by. At its yawning door stood a chubby ruler, sporting an iniquitous suit and shaved temples. When he flew out, the man inadvertently opened the shoulder straps and sent the chute pack flying off. The supreme skydiver plummeted toward a rocky plain and smashed into the boulders like a lard-filled meteorite, leaving a nasty smudge. Gould grinned, then shuddered. He turned his attention back up where yet another leader was released. This time he made out a heavily built military man in uniform, apparently from Sumurica. The commandant opened his chute immediately, yet his fleshy body loaded with metals proved too much for the cloth. Whirling erratically, his honors flew off, shredding the fabric of the chute and leaving no drag to slow him. When he bounced over a sharp rock, his body flew apart in a star-like pattern, his rump finally coming to rest on the large, hard spikes of a cactus plane. Gould swallowed. Thinking of his colleagues, he now saw ever more dots darting out. 
Was that Manny? The hair looked crazy enough, but with this insane wind, it could have been anyone. There, polling. No, that was a man. His eyes found another unknown leader exiting nearby. This fellow was an Arab leader sporting a traditional dish dash. He jumped confidently, but instantly the cloth wrapped up and around his head, leaving him butt naked. Gould chuckled. The Arabian was blinded and steered himself straight into the volcano, where he perished in a puff. Gould snickered, but was rudely pushed out of his harm joy when the door in an adjacent cabin opened to a deafening howl. Gould gawked at his frightened neighbor through a slit in the wall. The guy struggled to remain aboard in mortal terror, spreading arms and legs in an attempt to prop himself into the cabin, holding on to whatever little screw he could find. Yet the man stood no chance against the wind suction and was ejected in an instant. For a fraction of a second, Gould heard frantic screaming before the man was blown out of sight. He gulped. The video screen popped on. Dear contestant, hello. At this point, you will have boarded the delivery aircraft and are en route to the games, preparing to re-experience civilization and politics from the ground up. You may have wondered about the details of this dangerous experiment. Please pay close attention. Gould did, for the first time ever. You should have received your parachute. For those with a corporate background, no, they are not golden. Golden! The poly salivated at the thought, but then waved his hand dismissively. That would never work. Too heavy. The recording continued. Hopefully, you were attentive during your skydive training. If not, press the help button now. Training? He'd received none. Or had he forgotten? Gould looked around, found a red button, and punched it. The screen reacted. Thank you for pressing the help button. Your family has been notified of your departure. Departure? From the plane? From this world? I'm still here, Gould shrieked as he pounded the button. The machine continued. If you're still interested in learning about the island the living contestants will be experiencing, hit yes now. Gould did, and the screen displayed tropical vistas. All participants enter the island suited and should have received a pair of aviators. If you have received your aviators, equip them now. He did. Nice mirrored aviators. Looking sharp, if you chose to bring a survival kit instead of the aviators, good for you. Gould freaked. I didn't get to choose. Can I still choose? He pleaded. The apparatus continued. Terror Island is 100 square miles of sharp lava rock, vicious animals, treacherous forests, active volcanoes, mysterious streams, and beautiful beaches, although you won't have time to enjoy those. The screen showed cheerful bikini girls bouncing around. The image melted. Gould frowned. Predators on the island include, but are not limited to, jaguars, wolverines, lions, bears, and boars, the surrounding ocean may contain sharks, snakes, and hedge fund managers. Gould crossed himself. All contestants will be living in self-made shelters, splitting their time between studies and survival. Survival? One last note. To discourage breeding, all contestants' genitals have been deactivated. Gould hastily investigated his crotch. The machine printed a map. This concludes your pre-game briefing. Good luck in your quest to become a better legislator and leader. The device pumped music while the screen flashed a montage of island action shots. Then the media faded and the door in front of Gould disengaged. It got insanely windy. Gould's aviators vanished instantly, as did his map. Moments later, outside the craft, he reached terminal velocity, trying hard to remember anything he knew about parachuting. Visions of titties flashed up. Not now! He looked around and noticed a sleeve above his shoulder. Without hesitation, consideration, or any plan, Gould pulled it. The chute deployed, jerking him hard. He barfed. The Politicon scanned for a landing spot. He remembered his hair's beacon mode and activated it. Ahead lay a clearing. Just before landing, Gould released great air from his rump valve to soften the impact, and before he knew it, the poly hit the ground. You've heard part one of Politicons, written by Oliver Arnold, narrated by Adam Eleven Labs.